for life. Okay, welcome to this evening's board meeting. And we'd like to have roll call, please. Mrs. Harrington? Mr. Bennington? Here. Mrs. Downs? Here. Mrs. Eubank? Here. Ms. Lamer? Here. Mr. Pullman? Here. Could you all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, board will need to have a motion to adopt the proposed agenda. So move. Second. Second. Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Mrs. Downs. Yes. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Mr. Bennington. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Item number three, Board of Education recognition. Mr. Hustler. Uh, thank you. Um, this is an exciting um, portion of the meeting today. Um, we are recognizing the uh, American Legion Teachers of the Year. So we have a number of uh, folks that are on the line today joining us that we'd like to recognize. So with that, um, what I would like to do is um, turn it over to our principals who will introduce uh, their teachers. So with that, um, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Short and let me flip the screen to so it can pick him up now. So thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Short. Good afternoon, Mr. Oster. Thank you, Board of Education. It gives me great pleasure to recognize Rachel Newell as our American Legion Teacher of the Year. Rachel is also our Perrysburg Schools Foundation Teacher of the Year. Rachel has um, come back to Northwest Ohio. She spent a brief time in the Louisville, Kentucky area and has come back as a math teacher at the high school and has taught uh, algebra, geometry, um, some team taught classes and has been an advocate for students the entire time she's been here. She's been uh, kind of the conscience of the math department a little bit when it, when it comes to some things that we've had to deal with. And she's always very level headed in her approach to how um, we need to help students in, in their mathematics um, content and ability. Um, she recently did a uh, administrative internship with me, uh, which did an outstanding job and was, um, very instrumental uh, along with another teacher in uh, getting the Perrysburg schools as a group the Purple Heart Award um, from the state of Ohio Department of Education. So um, we really appreciate all of the things that Rachel has done for the high school and I'd like to thank her very much and, and ask the board to help me recognize her as the American Legion teacher of the year for the Perrysburg High School. Thanks. Congratulations, Rachel. Thank you for being recognized for this. That's quite an honor. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. And uh, congratulations on your award. So much deserved. So uh, next is uh, Mr. Scott Buecher, who will be introducing the Perrysburg Junior High uh, American Legion teacher. Uh, Mr. Buecher. Uh, so first off, I'd just like to, to thank the board as well. And it is my honor to introduce uh, Jason Jordan as the American Legion Teacher of the Year at Perrysburg Junior High. Um, Jason has, has been with us for uh, a few years now. Um, and kind of like when we like to describe the junior high in terms of uh, what we want our staff members to be like, Jason's usually one of the, the top faces that pops into our minds here. Um, he does our, our band programs. Um, he is just an incredible with our with our band students and the organizations of, of our band program. He also goes down to HPI and teaches a little bit there as well. Um, in the past, this year he was just at, at the junior high with us. Um, he's flexible. Um, he's so easygoing with uh, uh, with his program. Uh, a great example of that is we don't actually have a classroom for Jason, so he's actually on our stage every single day. Uh, teaching the students and he's made it work and it's been really good for our kids and and a lot of times if we have to use the stage for whatever reason it is he is always willing to accommodate for that as well 
Um, one of the things I really love about Jason is he is completely students first. He's student centered. Um, I think it was two years ago now, Jason came to the, our ministry of team and said, um, I really want to start a <laughs> section of our, for band for some students who need a little bit more individualized attention. Um, and he, and he came to us with the idea. He, he already had it figured out how to make it work already. And since then we've had this seven, eight band program that's had huge success and huge impacts on kids. Um, he's hundred percent in our community too. Uh, you'll see our junior high band in our parades, our Harrison Rally Day Parade, uh, our Memorial Day Parade, which unfortunately we didn't get to have this year. Um, but our marching yellow jackets are, are, are always in those, and, and Jason's always front and center, and the kids really enjoy those experiences. Um, you know, he's big into our, our band booster program as well. Um, every year they do the, the band on the run program, and uh, this year we couldn't do that, and and uh, instead of just canceling it, Jason and, and his co-teacher had a great idea of doing a virtual band on the run program. So it's it's never um, a, a we can't do this with Jason. It's a, a, and yet and this happens, but yet we're still going to do this. Um, so we're really excited to have him. Uh, and he's just a, a great representation of our junior high. Uh, another one of my personal favorite stories about uh, Jason is every morning if you come into our main entrance at the junior high. You will see him there greeting students, high-fiving kids. He's always got the big expression on his, on his face, the smile. Um, and we have several parents who always say, you know, who, who's that guy? I want my kid to be in that class. And, you know, so we think it's maybe a recruiting tool maybe for Jason and the band program too. And his reputation as our, our pet band director has, has circled across Northwest Ohio. We have a great junior high pet band that Jason uh, directs for us. Um, to the point where we have uh, certain officials who want us to schedule games with the pet band so they can be there and other opponents fans uh, stop, uh, stop us and, and comment about Jason's enthusiasm and our pet band performance as well. Uh, professionally, Jason is, is, is also involved in the OMEAs um, in terms of, of band. And actually this last, last year, Jason, you were featured in a national publication too, I believe. Um, so he's definitely, uh, an asset to what we do at the junior high. He's, he's great. His energy, his passion, his connection to students. We're really lucky to have him here. So thank Jason, thank you for all you do. And there's nobody more deserving than you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Buker, for those kind words. I really appreciate it. Brevity isn't my uh, strong suit, but I will try my best. I wanted to say thank you, uh, to the American Legion for this humbling award and their continued support of Perrysburg Schools educators. And while the award is, is given to one person, as Scott said, it, it takes a lot of people. And I'm really accepting the, the award on behalf of the amazing group of 615 band students, the families and the community members who work tirelessly to create a band program, which consistently achieves excellence throughout our region. And thank you to the Perrysburg Schools Administration and board members who have arduously worked to create performing arts opportunities for our youngest students in grades five through eight. And these opportunities are especially important for children right now in, in these uncertain times. So thank you for all you do for students and, and for band students and performing arts students specifically. And thank you for the award and congratulations to everyone else who was nominated. Thank you. That's great, thank you. And uh, appreciate all that you do every day. So um, I know that uh, uh, next we have uh, uh, Mr. Scott Best uh, and representing uh, Hall Prairie. So uh, Mr. Best. Thanks, you. Th thank you, Mr. Hostler. It's my honor to uh, share that Jessica Faust is the Hall Prairie Teacher of the Year Award. Um, this year for the American Legion. Um, Jessica is a very wonderful uh, teacher. She has probably one of the most difficult uh, roles uh, in our district, but yet uh, if you're having a bad day, her room is the place to go visit. The kids are always happy. They're always engaged in their learning and there's always new and fun things uh, going on. Um, Jessica's done a great job. Uh, uh, advocating for her students. Uh, she does that every day. Um, she finds new and, and uh, unique ways to find uh, opportunities for the kids on her caseload to be included. And we also 
uh, have several programs in place because of her where we have reverse inclusion going on. And <clears throat> again, it, it's just, uh, it's just an honor to have her on our staff. Um, when we went to remote learning uh, here a couple months ago, um, she, like I said, she, she probably had the most difficult uh, job in trying to figure out how to remote, uh, uh, create a remote learning environment for our kids. But she, she did such a great job. She even uh, impressed Robin Laird, who was working with one of her students. So. It's my honor and a pleasure to introduce Jessica Faust as the Hall Prairie Teacher of the Year Award. Thank you. I have a great team and get to work with the most amazing kids that truly make it easy to come to work every day. It's something that I look forward to and I really love what I do. So thank you, truly an honor. Congratulations, Jessica. And and uh, appreciate uh, the introduction, Mr. Best. And certainly uh, um, as we transition to the elementary, um, we know that the uh, five through 12 just do an outstanding job of, uh, of you know, finishing what, what has really started in the elementary. So, so with that, I'll introduce uh, Mr. Lou Marconi, who is the principal at Frank Elementary. Mr. Marconi. So Frank Elementary is uh, proud to recognize Betsy Bolano as our American Legion Teacher of the Year. Uh, unfortunately, she's unable to attend today, but she is our uh, K to four art teacher. And she is one of those unsung heroes at Frank Elementary. Uh, she does a great job building rapport with students. Um, as a part of Encore, she has over 450 students to learn, but she's still able to build a personal connection with each of them. Um, staff, uh, she's always willing to help out with uh, staff, whether it's in the office, um, in the cafeteria, in the hallway, she's all over the school uh, playing multiple roles and she does this without being asked. Um, she has unending patience, kindness and uh, hard work that often goes unnoticed. So we're very happy that Betsy's winning the award um, and I'm very grateful for, the, for this recognition. So congratulations, Betsy. Thank you, Ms. Marconi, and um, TOAS uh, Principal Hillary Steinmiller. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Steinmiller. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am very excited and honored to um, announce Jen Hooper as our TOAS Elementary Legion Teacher of the Year. Um, Jen was nominated and voted unanimously from our building leadership team for her constant efforts um, always putting students first, whether it be before school, during lunch, during recess, um, after school, she is usually the first one there and um, a lot of times the last one to leave and, and working really every minute in between. So um, I, I don't think that there is a child that Jen hasn't taken under her wing and loved like they were her own. Um, and I think that's evident by the number of students who come back and visit her room in the morning just to say hi or get a hug. Um, even in these times of remote learning, she made every effort to make those personal connections with students. Um, that was the number one uh, compliment I got from every parent I spoke with was how lucky they felt to have uh, Mrs. Hooper as a teacher. So um, I'm just so thankful and grateful to be able to share um, Mrs. Hooper, our Toth Elementary Legion Teacher of the Year. Congratulations, Jen. Thank you so much. And it truly is a privilege to work for Perrysburg Schools. And I really couldn't do my job well without my Toth family. I mean, the parents, the teachers, my wonderful principal, I couldn't do it well without all of them. So thank you and it's an honor and I appreciate the award very much. No, congratulations, and that's that's uh, a, certainly a, a very good message, and um, appreciate all the hard work, and especially this year, being away from the students, it was incredible to hear teachers talk about the way that they went over and above to connect, as, as, as you guys just mentioned, so I think that's what separates, I think, great teachers from from teachers, it's just that that personal connection, no matter what, so... So thank you, Mr. Wiltsey, uh, representing uh, Woodland Elementary School. 
Welcome, Mr. Wiltsey. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom and Board of Education members for the opportunity to recognize an absolutely outstanding teacher. Ashley Brown is uh, Woodlands American Legion Teacher of the Year. De dedicated, caring, encouraging. She's a leader. She's loving, thoughtful, helpful. Just a few of the words that describe this year's uh, American Legion Teacher of the Year from Woodland. She's consistently going above and beyond and has a positive impact on each and every one of her students. She's developed not only a classroom, but a learning style that revolves around the students, the very students in her class. She strives to support each student's need in an effort for them to achieve their greatest potential. In addition, she builds a relationship, that's a key, with the students from the first day she meets them. And that carries on in a connection, not only through her classroom, but through many years as the students travel through Perrysburg schools. Ashley pushes herself to be the very best teacher that she can for her students by having an open mind and being willing to try new things. And not only is Ashley a key player for her students, but she's also a very important member of the Woodland team. She's a go-to person for workers. She's a person who's trusted and respected to share information with, uh, not only uh, academically, but personally as well. She cares deep, deeply about uh, working with others and makes those people feel welcome as they come to our school. Ashley represents herself, her Woodland family, and the Prairie's Brick Schools in such a commendable way. Ashley, we're proud of you. Congratulations on this recognition. Thank you. And like you said, I couldn't do my job without my Woodland family, from everybody in the office to the wonderful paraprofessionals, um, to my teammates, to all the intervention specialists. It truly is the Woodland family. Um, so thank you to my Woodland family for everything. So thank you. Um, thank you. Um, next is uh, Mr. Uh, Marjo Cooper from Fort Meigs. So uh, thank you for joining us this evening and uh, we'll uh, let, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Hotzler. Uh, good evening, Board of Education members and Mrs. Price as well. Thank you for having me. Um, all my colleagues as well. Congratulations to the other winners. Uh, I'm very honored to uh, uh, identify Dan Black uh, as our American Legion Educator of the Year. Uh, Dan is a paraprofessional with us who works in the structured uh, support unit with us. Um, if there's, a, if there's a definition of someone who goes above and beyond, it's, it certainly is Mr. Black. He's always upbeat, uh, willing to help out a teammate, uh, willing to help out any student, most importantly, uh, at any cost. Dan worked with uh, Miss Lindsay Kirsten, who will be transitioning over to the high school with, with uh, Dr. Short. Um, I apologize to her for that, uh, but she was uh, happy enough to uh, write some things down for Dan. And she said that Dan, it was a blessing to work with this year. Within our room, the schedule is constantly changing, and Dan was willing to adapt and do whatever was needed and asked of him with no questions or complaints. Dan was not only a valued member of our team, but he also was a great role model to the students in my room as well in the general education classroom. This past year, Dan would not have been, this past year would not have been possible without Dan's positive attitude, willingness to work, kindness, and love to all of our students. Perrysburg as a district is lucky to have. Uh, Mr. Black, and as he is an amazing team player and fits in well with our staff, and he is most deserving of this award. I'm happy to work with Dan every day. He's always upbeat, uh, positive, and if you needed something and you, you needed it done right away, Dan was most certainly would do that to the best of intentions, uh, most importantly to help all of our students. So if there is one negative thing about Mr. Dan, as everybody, all the students call him, he is a big Michigan fan, so we try not to get too <laughs> But Go Blue. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he is a fantastic young uh, uh, professional, and I'm just lucky to have him on staff, and the district is lucky to have him as a as a teammate. So I understand he is here now, which is fantastic. He got the uh, dreaded, uh, he needed to upgrade. Uh, so, yes. Dan, Dan, congratulations. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. It's an honor. No. And Truly. Yeah. yeah. That's congratulations. Such an That's honor. I'm, I'm, I'm still speechless. That's a first for Dan. Uh, yes, it is. It is. With, with some things, but uh, oh yeah, yeah. I was Thank at Lowe's you. and you had me have tears in my eyes. So, <laughs> well, I think it's a great a great reminder that you know teachers come in all different shapes and sizes and play all different kinds of roles and. 
And, um, and I think you got a picture today of exactly, you know, how those connections are made and, and, you know, from the high school down to the elementary and, and everybody has an opportunity to play that role. And it's just such an important role. And, and you never really know the life that you're making a difference in until, you know, later. And I think that's one of the great things is we get a chance to pause that and recognize people today for the outstanding jobs that they did. And Gary Nordahl um, usually comes to the board meetings, the board members uh, that are um, familiar with him. And one day they were sitting in the American Legion and, and were talking about their own experiences. And these are men who fought and served the country and, um, and older and talked about the impact that teachers made in their lives and came to the board and said, you know, we want to do something to recognize teachers in a way that is meaningful. So this isn't a uh, program that, that we thought, let's, let's pat ourselves on the back, but Gary and his leadership, the American Legion saying, you know, of all the things that we've experienced in our lifetime here today, we want to reach out and say thank you to teachers and recognize teachers that are doing an outstanding job. And, and individuals that are connecting with kids. So I think it's important to not forget how this began and the intention behind it. And this is not just a attaboy, but it is really something special for us. And your names will be added to the plaque in, in each of your buildings. And, you know, it's, it's you know, great to see people looking at that all the time. And, um, and you know, we, we are grateful for all that you've done to our students. So thank you again. So congratulations, everyone. Yep. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, um, I'm going to um, uh, pull this, uh, pull share, share the flip back to the agenda for the moment for a moment. And um, next on the agenda is recognizing the Perrysburg High School speech and debate state qualifiers, and. Um, this is uh, this is an exciting annual event, and and you know that individuals uh, who make it onto the state level in, in in from music, which we celebrated last month, and athletics, um, speech and debate is another one of those areas where students uh, work incredibly hard uh, on their skill. And today in in the United States, there's a lot of debate going on in speeches. And it's a worthwhile skill that these students are, are fine tuning and they are um, you know, taking this practice into competition. And uh, once again, we have a number of, of students who are, and, and their names are listed here on, this, uh, on, on the agenda. And um, I'll pull up their picture. And, um, and certainly we're very uh, proud of, of everything that they've done. And uh, in a time where, where uh, speech and debate and thoughtful um, uh, discussions are needed more than ever, we've got a group of students who, who continue to, to achieve at a very high level. Um, I know their coach, uh, Mrs. Kemp, was very excited about being here. I know we're having a little bit of technical difficulty in getting her into the meeting. So um, we're kind of waiting to see if she can pop in, but if not, I know Dr. Short maybe wanted to say a few words about some of the seniors um, who are uh, who be part of this this wonderful team. So, thanks, Mr. Oster. I think there was only one senior on the team this year. They, um, we had a, a very young team, a, a smaller group than we normally have, about 25 kids. Um, but Keisha McPherson was our senior. She qualified for national, and it seems every time we recognize our speech and debate kids, we're always talking about uh, a couple of kids who qualified to be in the nationals, and of course. Given the circumstances of today, she um, the Nationals is being held virtually. Hopefully, all the coaches can get logged into the the virtual tournament, and uh, all the kids can get in there without any problems. But um, the Ms. Kemp is looking forward to uh, a lot of success in the future with her young program and and nurturing those kids along. She does a great job with them, um, and they've certainly performed outstanding across the state and to travel on to the national levels as well. So she was real excited about having them uh, moving forward and, and earning more accolades for the team. Thank you, Dr. Short, and, and, um, and certainly a, a group that we're very proud of. And, and each year, I th think the bar gets set higher and higher. And um, look forward every year to hearing how they do. And 
the numbers of qualifiers and, and um, individuals that make it to the next round is impressive. So um, we're very proud of, of each of the students for what they've done, those state qualifiers. So thanks. All right, so, um, so next on the agenda is a superintendent's report. And uh, there's, there's two items um, that, that just wanted to share uh, briefly um, with the board. Well, one is brief and the other may not be so brief. Um, so the first thing um, on April 8th, the Board of Education met um, and gave the treasurer and superintendent um, authority, uh, additional authority um, during this shutdown and COVID related items to, to handle and, and um, take care of things. Um, I was asked to share with the board um, those items that, uh, that, that we were approving. And um, this is actually the second item during this time period that I've asked the board to, to um, that I've done on behalf of the board and making the board aware. Um, this appears on the um, agenda, uh, item 13.1. So that'll be coming up later. And, um, and uh, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll have an opportunity to talk more in depth about that. So, but just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, I just got uh, word that Deb Kemp uh, did, was able to punch in. So if, you, if, if Mr. Pullman, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll punch her in very quickly and, and then jump back into the presentation if that's okay. So um, I'm excited to hear from her uh, about her, her season this year and her athletes or, or her competitors. Okay. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you now. Great, Deb. Thank you. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> We had you for a minute, Deb, and then we lost you. Let's try it again. How's that? Good. Perfect. Okay, we're good. Okay, I don't know what's going on. This is making me worried because I'm actually judging at nationals this week uh, for, and it's all online and it's all with Zoom and um, we're having all sorts of technical difficulties. So that's exciting. Um, anyways, I kind of missed what you were saying. Uh, this year I had 24 students on the team 20 of them made it to state uh what's really remarkable about these 20 kids which actually ties uh the amount of qualifiers i've had in the past like two years ago but you see there nine freshmen six uh sophomores who were the six sophomores who um were freshmen last year which i was like completely blown away having six freshmen to states and now this past year i had nine and um, the rest are juniors and one senior. My girl, Acacia McPherson is the um, qualifier at nationals and she is competing via her video at nationals this week in drama. Um, so we are very honored to uh, be recognized and we hope to figure out how to do this next year. We have, um, this is the team to do it with because they are a young and very, very highly driven, talented group. Well, congratulations, Deb. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm glad I got on for a minute there. So thank you. Thank you to Dr. Short, who sent me the uh, correct uh, um, uh, login. So that's great. Thank you. Well, congratulations again, Deb, and, and you didn't hear us say, but we were very excited that, uh, that each year we look forward to your um, speech and debate team members who, who, who show up at our board meeting and we get to celebrate them. And, and you've really grown this program into be something very special. So thank you so much for all that you do. All right. All right. Well, th thank you very much. And uh, at this time, we'd like to, to move uh, to the next um, 
item on the agenda. Mr. And, Hassan, before yeah. you do, yep. can I just ask the board, this is gonna be a pretty lengthy um, presentation. If we could hold all of our questions to the very end, take notes, take slide numbers, anything you've, you know, as we come across, because what <laughs> typically happens, we'll ask a question and they'll say, yep, we're coming to that in slide 16. So I think if we let Mr. Hassan just go from start to finish, but please jot down questions for Mr. Hassler. Um, as we as we finish with his presentation, we'll certainly have time for some discussion. Mr. Hassler. All right. All right, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Pullman. And, um, and I know that um, those folks that joined us, they're free to, to kind of log off. And, um, and that way we can kind of resume to the, um, to the rest of the agenda, um, completing that. So, so with that, um, we want to um, move to the uh, presentation, uh, the Perrysburg Schools Return to Learning uh, for 2020-2021 school year. Um, so um, I'll ask uh, Bryce to, um, to um, load up the, the presentation for us. Um, so I know there's been a lot of, of conversation and, and certainly um, a lot of concern about what's going to happen next year after what happened this year. And um, um, can you so we've been happening? looking at the best information um, that, that we have and beginning to plan for the future. And I know there's been some discussion about why do we need to plan for the future. There are certainly um, things that, that we recognize that we need to start preparing for. And with a school district the size of Perrysburg, almost you know, a little over 5,700 students, um, the number of buildings that we have, all of those things, we know that we need to, um, we, we know we need to make sure that we're working on a, a plan to restart. So I see a, a note, note here that the audio is not very good right now. Okay, how, how does that, is that any better? Much better. Okay, all right. Um, so, um, so what we know today, so let's go through a couple of quick things as we start to get into the discussion. And I think it's really important for us to understand that, that we, have, um, we have to plan. Waiting and, and hoping that maybe someday this week, there'll be something that the governor will say to give us more direction, um, you know, or maybe next week. We've been kind of living that life for some time. And I think for us, we wanted to come up with a framework that will help us build from whatever announcement comes from Columbus. And I think that's where we are today. So, so this image here, there isn't something downloading slowly. This is what you get when you're waiting. That's how we've been feeling here in schools uh, for some time. There's this kind of delay, like, okay, when are we gonna get this information? And we've been asking for the, basically the kind of the building blocks. How many students can we get on a bus? How many students can we have in a classroom? And, and those are really the essentials that we can begin to plan appropriately. And, um, and, and we're still waiting. So that this is kind of, when you see that icon, you know it's a little bit frustrating and that's how we feel. But we certainly understand and respect the delay in getting us this information. So, so the, the decision makers who, who are involved with this, and I wanted to take a moment because you know previously at a board presentation, we talked about door number one, two, and three, and we gave a highlight, you know, what, what is door number one? And, and that's a traditional school year with, you know, a few things in place um, in, in respect of, of COVID, but the number of kids on buses and the activities and everything we're doing, there, there's going to be some changes to help keep, keep kids safe, but by and large, it's going to look and feel like a typical school year. Then we know what door number two was, if you recall, and that is all virtual, which is what we've been living here since March here in, in across the state. And then door number three is a combination of both. And, uh, and so we spent a little bit of time talking in the last board meeting about that. But the decision makers who are ultimately going to help guide us through one of these three doors is, of course, the governor and the Ohio Department of Health. Those two agencies, um, you know, or that agency with the governor's direction, closed schools down. And on June 30th, 
um, they're going to open up the buildings again. And they've already begun to open up different types of activities around school. So we be, we've begun to see that. The state legislature is another, um, another entity that can weigh in and pass laws. And we've, we've, we're gonna reference some of those laws and there's others that they're, they're working on this week before they're on recess. And the legislature has the ability to, to, to um, weigh in on how things should work here in Ohio. Of course, the Ohio Department of Education, we spent some time talking about a draft that they sent out, a return, a restart draft, return and restart. And in, in it, it had guidelines that we've spent a lot of time studying and talking about. And then the local health department. So in Wood County, we have a, um, a health department, we have a director of public health, and um, he is somebody that works with schools, communicates very well with all of us, not only schools, but businesses, and, and continues to um, be a factor in, in any decisions. Uh, with local businesses, he has, you know, fielding calls from customers, from residents, from businesses in terms of how to handle certain things. And then, of course, the local school board. And we've already heard the governor talk about how the local school boards have the ability to, to set the start date for next school year, that we can have a, um, a, a start uh, of the school year next year, which really wasn't uh, breaking news for us. We knew that that was going to happen. For some people, I think there might've been some questions, will school happen in the fall? But we know that this is something that um, is going to, to be possible. So I think as we look at this framework, and, and I know um, um, Assistant Superintendent Price and, and the team has, has done a remarkable job of, of looking into that crystal ball, looking at the different decision makers, what's being said, um, and, and where we need to go. And I think this is an important point here. The virus is a serious risk, um, and, and we know that. It's something that we have to respect. Um, it, is, it is deadly, and, and we, we understand that. We also understand that there are risks involved in not having students back in school. Um, there, there are some academic and physical and mental issues that can come up with a prolonged absence. So we understood that. So, um, so we're trying to prepare for the reality of schools uh, in face-to-face -face return and, and social distancing being part of what we do. No matter what door we go through, dealing with COVID and keeping our staff and our families and students safe is going to be part of our future until there's a vaccine or there is some type of treatment that is successful. So this isn't something that's going to go away and we're gonna to continue to fine tune everything that we're doing. So, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Price who will kind of walk us through um, this conversation. Good evening. So we're going to start by talking about the survey that we gave. And we want to thank all the families that did respond. We had over 2,200 responses. And with that, we found that if we have a plan, around 45% of people are very comfortable with their students returning. We have around 20% of our families that are somewhat comfortable. So 65% of families are ready for their kids to be back in school. However, we do still have 27% of people that really need to know what our plan is to keep students safe, to keep families safe. And then we have a little over 4% of people that they are not comfortable sending their children regardless. They have, there's health issues, there are other concerns, but it's simply not going to be an option for those families. And while that looks like a small percentage, again, out of a, with a district of 5,700 students, 4% is a couple hundred students. So this tells us that we do need to, to plan to make sure we're keeping safety in mind, but also working to get students back in person. The other questions that we asked in the survey really help us with our planning portion. So it helps us figure out how many more computers may we need if we would have to go to remote again at any point in time, who might have internet access, whether or not families even have access to a working thermometer, who might be able to obtain a mask. So some of these, those questions are helping us in our planning moving forward. Additionally, the questions about transportation. We do appreciate all the feedback families gave us as well. The mask 
issue is very divisive. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward with the presentation. And we'll also talk a little bit later, but people can expect, families can expect some additional questioning to come from the building level that will likely be non-anonymous to help us really fine tune our planning once we have guidance and, and move forward with what's going to start or how we're going to start next school year. So what can we learn from the past to plan for the future? One thing I think we have to keep in mind is the history of previous pandemics and what we can learn from that. And previous pandemics have been characterized by those wave of activities spread over months. And so there can be periods of time where that disease activity drops, but we really need to balance that with the possibility of another wave. And again, keep in mind, history will tell us those waves can be separated by months. So an immediate at ease, business completely as usual may be premature and we do have to account for that. We also know kids need to be in school. So here's some information we pulled from what's happening around the world. Again, we know parents need to work. We know we need to get kids in front of teachers. So Europe has been opening some of their schools. Denmark opened primary schools first, reasoning that young children were the least at risk and most dependent on parents who need to return. The good news is, is this was dated May 10th, that since returning that reproduction factor has remained low, but keep in mind it's very early. This is a novel virus. We're learning more about it as time goes on and they are working now on how to get their older students in as well. So while that is encouraging and we know we need to get kids in person, again, we still need to keep up with the new information coming out about the virus. We also know we have to focus on that, the mental health needs of students. So we know this time has been very trying for students, for families, for everyone. And so our crisis team and Jacket Wade team, they're meeting over the summer to discuss those social emotional needs. So they're going to be discussing how to, to address the mental health needs of kids, providing professional development on trauma-informed care, addressing those social emotional learning needs, and also how to provide additional support to families that may continue to have needs due to COVID-19. There are families that have been impacted by this, students that can't stay with their family members because of diagnosis. So they're temporarily, their lives are turned upside down, having to live with someone else for periods of time. That, that is happening. And also how do we provide needed support to staff members? Again, this is a lot of anxiety for everyone and teachers, teachers are givers. They're service oriented, it's a service oriented profession. And that weighs a lot on our staff members' minds as well. So we are, we are conscientious of that as we move forward. So I wanna take a moment to go over safety practices that will apply to all of our buildings. These are things we know we're going to need to work on implementing regardless of the model that we start the school year with in terms of the daily schedules. So we know we're gonna to have to build in frequent hand washing routines across the district. At this point in time, and again, we are continuing to stay up to date as much as we can with what we know about, about the virus. At this point in time, we're anticipating masks may be likely in common areas with high student traffic. So hallways, arrival, dismissal. And again, keep in mind that the, the thought be the science behind masks is preventing the amount of droplets in the air. So when you have areas of higher congestion with lots of different students where it's harder to socially distance, that would be the logic behind that. Again, we're waiting for guidance we may not have a choice. If the guidance is that masks must be worn, then we'll have to tackle that. We'll talk a little bit on a later slide, but we are pursuing exploring some possible different options, face shields, for example, which we'll talk about in a bit. Right now, we're gonna work on social distancing as much as we can in those common areas, looking at traffic patterns, ways students will enter and exit different places. We're working on arranging furniture or removing furniture to allow for as much, as much social distancing within the classrooms. Right now we're able to get approximately four feet within classrooms. We won't be holding large school assemblies. We're looking at staggering the use of our lockers. Again, how we unload students in the morning, move them through their day, all of those aspects we're logistically working on to ensure as much distancing as we're able to. Just for reference, Mr. Hostler did review this on an earlier presentation back in May, but if we were required to go to a strict six foot social distancing at the high school, for example, we would be looking at going from 27 desks in the classroom down to nine. At the junior high, we would be looking at going to around 12 to 13 desks 
In a typical classroom, maybe 14, 15 desks we could fit in a larger classroom, but again, certainly a reduced capacity from what our typical class sizes are. HPI would be around 10 students in a classroom, and then elementary around 10 to 12. And that's with a strict six foot social distancing, just to give you a point of reference. We're also looking at our sensory rooms. We have students with multiple sensory needs that do require that outlet during the day. So we're looking at making sure we schedule that time or limit it to one student during unnecessary or during necessary unscheduled use. And of course, thoroughly cleaning between students. Parent guardian meetings, we would work to hold virtually as much as possible. We're also working on modifying our custodial schedules, and this would allow for more support when students are present. So currently we have our day custodians, our night custodians, and shifting some of those night custodians to be present when kids are there to allow more frequent clean of surfaces throughout the day. Again, staggering transitions with those bell schedules, administrators at the secondary level in particular have been working on this. Those modified arrival dismissal procedures, staggering exits, entrances, et cetera. Also, we'll be limiting sharing of materials between students with cleaning between use if any sharing were to be necessary. In terms of our students with disabilities, we've been working very closely with the Department of Pupil Services, and we're looking at ways we could possibly modify or blend service delivery. Certainly, teachers may be pushing into home rooms, and you'll see why in a few slides moving forward, as well as thorough cleaning between students pulled for small group instruction with social distancing incorporated into those small groups. And of course, remote opportunities as well as necessary. No visitors or volunteers would be coming into the buildings. And we're looking at modifying those sign in sign out procedures for parents who need to pick up or drop off their students during the day. Some additional safety measures that we're working on as the district is purchasing that personal protective equipment. So for example, I think previously mentioned 60% of our bus drivers are over the age of 60, which is a real concern for us. So we're looking at attempting to obtain N95 masks for our bus drivers. We are exploring face shields if those are allowable. And right now, a, one of the issues is that we're not quite sure the wording that the Ohio Department of Health will use in their guidance. So if the wording indicates that face coverings are acceptable, we may be able to explore a shield option, which essentially is a headband with a clear plastic covering that would go below a student's chin, but it's less restrictive and certainly, especially for younger students, would eliminate the constant tugging and pulling on a mask. So if the guidance is face covering, we may be able to explore that option if the guidance is specifically masks. And again, that would be due to safety recommendations. If that is the wording, then we would be required to look at mask options. So that's something we are exploring. Plexiglass dividers, in those high traffic areas, we're in the process of, of purchasing those, looking into touchless faucets or and installation of water bottle refilling stations versus the typical drinking fountains. We're also purchasing what, what's called a Clorox 360 machine. And these are spray machines that allow for disinfecting and sanitizing surfaces with a, a wand essentially. So it's much quicker and convenient to sanitize a whole room and equipment within that room in a much quicker fashion. We're looking at the sanitizer and hand washing stations, getting additional equipment to be able to strategically place throughout the buildings. Of course, COVID-19 safety training for our students. We're also going to be incorporating what those expectations may look like into our jacket way, because certainly it, there's going to be a teaching component to this in terms of safety. For next school year, we will have full-time health aides in each building. Previously, elementary health aides split two buildings, but we will be ensuring that there is a health aide in each building during the school day while students are in session. And then the procedures for temperature checks. So this is very challenging logistically. So we are currently working on how and what may need to happen for that. So what happens if six feet of social distancing isn't required or there's a lesser standard recommended? We're going to continue to evaluate the recommendations and adjust our plans to bring the maximum number of students that we can based on the conditions and our ability to get them to school. So given what we know today, the proposed models moving forward, we have really built those around a schedule that considers the age and grade levels of students. One thing to note is that we are considering a four-day in-person week with Monday's remaining a remote learning day throughout the year. 
And we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about why, but staffing decisions, budget reduction plans, and then possible pandemic spikes and needing to be prepared for those potential waves that could happen are a big part of our consideration for that option. Preschool is already currently a four day program. So if this is something that the district decided moving forward, preschool would follow the same schedule and they would also attend Tuesday through Friday. In the past, they attended Monday through Thursday. So why? Why maintain a remote learning day and a four day in-person learning schedule if all the restrictions are lifted? Again, while that scope of need is challenging to predict, we do recognize that there will be a continued need. There could be groups of students needing to quarantine at any point in time, and that button could keep restarting for multiple groups of students in terms of if there is a, a student's diagnosed with COVID-19. Possible mandated closures can happen at any point in time. We'll be working closely with the health department regarding our own district and local data. And certainly we're gonna have students with health risks that are not going to be able to return. So we know we're going to continue to need an online platform to deliver instruction. Also, another consideration is that by maintaining that remote day, it allows for continued improvement. So we are better able to flexibly go to those options as necessary. Of course, that in-person, that four day in-person week also provides time for the teachers to collaborate and plan to improve that remote instruction while also providing in-person. So essentially, there could be multiple times throughout the year where teachers are really having to provide instruction in two different formats. And there's also some science behind allowing the virus an additional day over the weekend to die on those surfaces and to be able to do some deeper cleaning before all of the students would return. While addressing the financial impact of COVID-19, again, we're not in a situation where we are able to double our teaching staff or hire a, several other custodians. We really are going to need to work within the parameters of what we have as best we can to plan for a lot of unknowns. Here's an example of a disruption that could happen at any point of, in time during the year. So the high school has 1,700 students and 96 teachers, counselors, other licensed staff. So let's say in a given week, five students test positive for COVID. All of those five students would be self-quarantined. If five students have six different teachers, that's 30 staff members that could need to be quarantined out of 96. Again, if each of those students have different classes, they're with on average 26 other students in six classroom, there's potentially 780 additional students that may need to quarantine. And again, we'll work with the health department on what those guidelines are for quarantine, but currently it would be if you're exposed or with someone that's been a confirmed diagnosis for more than 15 minutes. That doesn't count other potential students those students may have come into contact with. But even just looking at the students they could be in class with and the teachers they could have, five positive results during the course of the year could result in 46% of our high school body being placed under quarantine and 31% of our teaching staff. And again, that can happen at any point in time. So we're planning for the best, but preparing for restrictions. As required social distancing and safety procedures are able to be relaxed based on recommendations, we are going to work, we want to bring all students back for in-person learning. Whether it's the five-day or four-day in-person model, that will be a consideration for the board in our district. But if this isn't possible, by the start of the next year then, we will need to start with the following hybrid learning model. And that's what we wanna to share today to give the community an idea of what the year could look like if we do need to start with this option. So our hybrid learning model. Essentially, we ended up here by a process of elimination. We had a lot of different experts in terms of within our own departments and buildings, putting multiple ideas and researching what's been done across really the whole world with how to get kids back safely. And then we started looking at what's possible with the staff and the financial situation that we have and what we can do moving forward. So what you're going to see is really a, a, a brainstorm and a group effort coming up with what are the best options we feel are for our district given the resources that we have. So we considered what's realistic. How can we realistically mitigate that risk and get kids back in person? We also looked at child development. We know our younger learners are less independent. We also know we need flexibility. We have to be prepared to instruct students who cannot attend in person due to health risks or may need to quarantine at any point in time for a couple weeks. 
and also be prepared to flip that switch again and go to remote learning for all students if there is another mandated closure or if there's a hot spot or an outbreak within our own community. We also wanna to try to maintain as many of our excellent academic options and programming as we can. Given the budget reductions, we, we want to try to figure creative ways to do that. And then of course, time and resources. Again, how are we providing for the planning and effort this is going to take to provide potentially two different platforms at any point in time during the year? So we'll start with preschool. So currently there are childcare guidelines, which is likely that the preschool is going to need to follow, which says that nine, it can be nine students per teacher. Our preschool program maintains a 50-50 ratio of students with disabilities and students without disabilities. For our preschool, what this would look like then is basically half the students would attend Tuesday, Thursday, and half the students would attend Wednesday, Friday. Mondays, there would be virtual or home activities to further support the learning or IEP goals and objectives, because we know there are going to be required minutes that we need to hit in regards to those early intervention services. We also know that we will need to balance providing virtual as well as some of those play-based assessments for children who are referred or exiting early intervention due to their age. Those students too in preschool would engage in any gross motor, motor activities exclusively with their class. Currently, they group together for some of those activities. As of now, there is no licensing requirement from the state for masks for preschool students. And of course, a preschool would follow any hand washing requirements as outlined by the state. And since our preschool program does have an AM and a PM session, we would be sanitizing the room and the materials between sessions of students. So here's a sample preschool schedule. And again, this presentation will be attached in our board docs on our website. So people will be able to go back and refer to this. But essentially, you'll see students are divided up and split into groups. And so group A, there's eight students attending on Tuesday, Thursday. Group B is attending Wednesday, Friday. Those are in the morning. And then group C would attend in the afternoon, Tuesday, Thursday. Group D would attend in the afternoon, Wednesday, Friday. The preschool times would currently remain the same. Next, before we get into the school models, we're going to talk a little bit about transportation. No pun intended, but on many levels, transportation drives what we can and can't do. Additionally, the Ohio Revised Code says that we cannot reduce service mid-year. So we can't start service in one area and say, well, I don't think that's really a good financial decision. We're not able to attend all the time. We're going to pull that away. Whatever we start the year off with, we have to maintain. We can always add service, but we cannot reduce it. So one example of a challenge that we have is Frank Elementary, there are currently four buses, around 70 students ride those buses to school each morning. So around four buses transport 280 students. If the requirement is one student per seat, which it may be, we would need a total of 10.8 buses, that's 6.8 additional buses to get the same number of students to and from school. So that presents quite some logistical challenges for us. If we would have to adhere to a strict six feet social distancing on a bus, certainly that would pose even a greater challenge. We would be looking at only being able to transport 13 students at a time. Again, at this point in time, our planning is based on at least a one student per seat or one family per seat model. And we're hoping to have ex more exact guidance on that soon. If we can get more than one student per seat, then obviously logistically that would be even less challenging for us. So our planning involved one student or one family per seat in terms of the models that we're proposing or going to be proposing. So again, in the Ohio Revised Code, by law, we have to transport students in grades K-8. We can also ask students who walk to school, who live within a two mile radius of their school building to be to walk. And so how that works is essentially there's a two mile radius drawn around the building. And if your home falls within that area, you would be a walker. If it falls outside of that area, you could be eligible for transportation. So if we can only transport one student per seat as seen on the previous slides, we would need as many buses as possible to transport all of those K-8 students. So as a result, if that does happen, we may need to extend that walk area to two miles as well as eliminate transportation to high school students. If we eliminate transportation to high school students, there would also be an elimination of transporting students to go to private school who are in grades nine through 12. Those buses 
And those routes would then be reconfigured and be reassigned to transport elementary, HPI, and junior high students at that one student or family per seat ratio. Moving into our elementary plan. So for elementary next year, even in our hybrid model, our intent is to return elementary students to in-person learning full days, four days a week, Tuesday through Friday. Monday would stay that remote learning day. No students would physically attend, unless of course they were medically fragile or some other types of situations where that may apply. And the reason behind, the logic behind this would be that students would remain with their homeroom class throughout the day. We're able to contain our younger students in a different fashion just due to the fact that they don't have multiple teachers throughout their school day in the same manner as some of our older, well, our older students do. And so in this example, fourth grade teachers who departmentalize would move between classrooms, the students would stay put. Students would still have their specials, their encore class, art, music, library, STEM, but those teachers would be pushing into the classrooms to deliver that instruction. PE could be outside when the weather permits. We would be using the gym. We have worked out some, some logistical some logistical plans and we should be able to disinfect the gym and equipment between classes when the gym is in use. It would be extremely challenging logistically to disinfect all of the special area rooms with the way that the encore schedule lines up at the elementary level. But again, th this is preliminary. We would be looking at it at, at the very least being able to utilize the gym. Students would eat lunch with their homeroom. They may be able to go outside or on certain occasions, we could designate some space in the cafeteria or gymnasium for a homeroom. They would report to the cafeteria in a staggered fashion so that one homeroom is in the cafeteria at a time to pick up their lunch and take it to the classroom as necessary. Or depending on the way that lunch is delivered, we may be able to actually take it to the classrooms for students. Elementary students would have recess. We would be designating certain areas outside for them and they would be playing with their own homeroom only. Again, depending on supervision, this may result in outdoor recess being two days a week and indoor recess being two days a week for children, depending on that supervision and space. Our disclaimer. So if being able to limit students to contact within their homeroom is not sufficient for our local health department and other mandates, and we're required to say, for example, maintain a six feet of social distancing at all times, then elementary would have to follow a 40% in-person, 60% remote learning hybrid model. In that instance, students would, students would be divided into two cohorts within their home rooms, half the class attending Tuesday, Thursday, and the other half attending Wednesday, Friday. Remote learning would be available on all those days. Monday would stay that remote learning day for students, no students would attend. Again, part of in, in the hybrid model for the elementary building in that Monday as a remote learning day, we know we're going to have students that continue to need that platform. We know we may have to switch back at any point in time if a whole class or even a whole school may have to be quarantined for any portion of time. But additionally, again, we're working within the resources we have. So in this option, teachers will be doing additional supervision during the day and they will be losing some plan time that they originally had. And so we are going to build that into those Mondays then because certainly teachers are going to need, they're still going to need time to plan. In terms of a sample schedule, the hours would stay the same. Again, Monday would be a remote learning day. All students would come at their normal times. They would receive instruction in their homeroom during the school day. They would have a 45 minute encore class. So that STEM, art, music, PE, library, those periods would happen daily. However, they would take place with that teacher coming into the classroom to deliver instruction with the exception of PE. Students would have a 30 minute lunch. Again, they'd be eating in the class um, with their teacher and their, their classmates. And then they would have a 30 minute recess daily. We may have to alternate between indoor, outdoor, depending on some of that supervision and space outside. For HPI, HPI typically follows more of a junior high model, but if we have to start hybrid, we're going to be making some tweaks to their schedule to more follow what an elementary schedule may look like. So HPI would also be returning to in-person learning full days, Tuesday through Friday, if we need to start in that hybrid model. Monday would stay that remote learning day, no students physically attend. In this case, instead of with one homeroom, they will stay with their team. 
Again, older students are a little bit better to socially distance throughout that day. And we work to reduce the number of grade level transitions and overall school transitions. So overall transitions in the school day was reduced by 30%. And then grade level would be reduced by 60% and they would all be staggered. In order for this to happen, at this point in time, the exploratory classes, so those performing arts, the choir, band, music, as well as the extra electives. So students would still have an, a creative arts in their day, but the extra STEM, art, PE classes, those would be suspended for a year because right now, the way those classes are worked into the schedule requires cross teaming. And again, we're reducing the risk by eliminating that cross teaming that happens at HPI. There's an asterisk besides the performing arts because we are still exploring possible options where maybe students who are in those performing arts classes, maybe that is their elective class in place of the normal creative arts, but we're going to have to be continue, continuing to work on those schedules to see if that's possible. So we are still working to try to make that happen, but there's a lot of moving parts to that that are still in the works. Lunch, so at HPI, luckily the, the cafeteria at HPI is very large and there's multiple entrances and exits since it is in the middle of their, their building. And so adjustments are going to make, be made to the seating to allow for additional spacing and students would eat with their same group throughout the year instead of switching every quarter. But there should still be an ability to do some social distancing and have those students use the cafeteria. Again, creative arts classes, those would be run similar to what the elementary runs, but they would be composed of students from the same team. Currently, they're composed of students from two teams and we would be ensuring that it's down to one team. Recess would be eliminated for next school year at HPI. Again, the keeping students socially distanced and, and keeping everything sanitized at HPI, given that they don't have one home room, is significantly more challenging and significantly more risky. Plus by eliminating recess, we'd be able to assign the monitors to the commons area to help with the additional supervision and cleaning that students are going to need during lunchtime. We're also going to need assistance in helping to enforce those traffic patterns that are going to prevent teams from crossing into each other during the transition to and from the commons and it eliminates the entire building transitioning at one time in their school day. Again, our disclaimer for HPI is the same as the elementary. So if we have to start on that hybrid model and being able to limit students to contact with others within their own team is not sufficient per local health department, any other mandates. Example, we have to stick to a strict six foot social distancing at all times, then they would also follow that 40-60 hybrid model. So 40% in person, 60% remote learning. They'd be, each grade level would be split into two cohorts, one group attending Tuesday, Thursday, and one attending Wednesday, Friday. Remote learning would be available on all the days, but Monday would stay that remote learning day and no students would attend. Sample schedule for HPI. Again, you'll see the school hours are, are the same. Monday would be a remote learning day. Again, there's going to be additional supervision throughout those days for, for teachers. All students would arrive between their normal time that they have in the past. There would be an extended home room and then they would have their four 60 minute core classes with their team and then their one 50 minute creative arts class within their team. Again, we are trying to be creative to see if those performing arts class for those students in those courses could be their creative arts class for a portion of the year, but we're still working on those details. Their lunch and jacket period would be slightly extended. Again, we're needing to do that to allow for those staggered transitions. And then of course, there'd be a staggered dismissal as well. All of their transition times would be increased to five minutes and students would be traveling within their teams. And then of course, tables and areas wiped down between any groups of students. The junior high, obviously as students get older, there are multiple more electives. There's multiple more situations where teacher licensure comes into play because they're licensed for a particular subject. And so being able to contain students to a homeroom or group is much more challenging at the secondary level, junior high on up. So junior high would be needing to do a blended model, 40% in person, 60% remote. Each grade level would be divided into two cohorts, one group attending in person Tuesday, Thursday, one would attend Wednesday, Friday. 
Again, remote learning would occur on all of the days and students would be expected to access that on remote learning days if they're not physically attending. Monday would stay that, that remote day for everyone regardless. So here's a sample schedule for a junior high student. And anytime you're building in as much remote learning as would happen at the junior high, if we have to start in that hybrid model next year, you're really flipping your classroom. You're planning for that remote learning piece as a grade level team, as a departmental team, and you're maximizing that in-person time. And so there would be a lot of collaboration going into how that would look moving forward. I want to state again, I don't know if I stated it again in this presentation, but I've been talking a lot with staff throughout the past week. What happened to us in the spring was emergency. And we know moving forward, we, we really feel we need to be able to have a plan to be able to improve our remote methods and be better prepared for the future. So at the junior high, each grade level would be split in half. They would follow their regular schedule. Three days a week would be virtual, including Mondays. Possibly on Mondays, there could be some medically fragile or other students that may need remediation coming in. There would be busing provided to the junior high, but essentially students would be attending in person two days a week, either Tuesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Friday. High school, as you can imagine, as challenging as the junior high is, the high school is exponentially more challenging. And so they would start with that hybrid start, again, flipping that classroom, and then working on schedules to bring in cohorts of students for that face-to-face -face instruction. Remote learning would be available for all students Monday through Friday. They would be expected to access remote learning on, on all of the days, and particularly days they're not in session. And schedules are in the process of being developed to bring in groups and cohorts of students for in-person learning. So one example would be, again, Monday, that remote learning day, and then Dr. Short and his team are working on the logistics of dividing students up by their ID numbers. And so students with odd numbers, for example, would attend two days and even numbers attending two days. They are working as well uh, with pulling all the student addresses to ensure that siblings would be able to attend the same days even if their numbers were different. So making sure families have that option for consistency and having their kids go on the same days is certainly many siblings will probably be transporting younger siblings to and from the high school. So essentially half the number of students would attend two days a week. Again, three days a week, including Mondays would be virtual. Mondays may be used to bring in medically fragile students or students needing remediation, mental health support, et cetera. In the hybrid model, if we are required to have one student per seat, however, there would not be transportation to the high school because we are required to transport K-8 and we would need to be repurposing those routes for our K-8 students. So what about our medically fragile students and employees? We know that regardless of guidelines and those social distancing requirements, we're going to have some students and employees who can't return. So we will be providing online learning with possible support on those Mondays. We're also going to work to accommodate each employee to the extent that we can. We're also exploring our ability to extend those online options for families with children who may not be technically medically fragile or qualify as medically fragile, but families that have multiple concerns that the hybrid options are not sufficient in regards to that protection from COVID-19. So, which brings up the next point with extracurriculars. Again, skills and conditioning practices are permitted, we're still waiting for a determination regarding OHSAA for that fall athletic season. But one point I do want to make here is that I know it's challenging at this point in time when things are starting to open up. People want to throw their hands up and say, what's the point? No one's social distancing. Everyone's around each other. But I think we have to keep in mind things like extracurriculars, people have a choice with whether or not to participate in those. And one thing we have to keep in mind is Education's a right. Every student has a right to a free appropriate public education. And we have a responsibility to figure out ways that people can safely do that and protect all of our students and our employees. We also have several hundred employees in the district that we have to consider with our plans as well. In terms of our after hours and weekend use of facilities, again, this would likely be restricted due to needing to arrange those existing custodial schedules to provide support when students are present as well as to limit exposure from outside groups once the building has been sanitized for the day. I'm gonna talk briefly about the financial impact of COVID-19 as well. 
So as mentioned in a previous presentation, we did see a reduction of 8.2% 8, 8 in state aid. So that was over $972,000 that our district took as a loss this current fiscal year. The way that we receive that money is through payments throughout the year. And the amount that we were set to receive through the end of this fiscal year was less than the amount that they cut. So we actually are having to write a check back for that difference, which is certainly something we were not anticipating, nor could anyone given, given COVID-19. In a time of uncertainty, we know we need to increase safety surrounding a return to school, but we also know that reduction of state and local funding, that is a reality for us. So our plan is really working hard to try to figure out how to find that balance and work with what we have. We also know the virus is it's highly contagious and it is a danger to people. We need to be vigilant and disciplined in how we operate. We, we really can't, it's not responsible to throw up our hands and say we're not going to do anything. And again, with limited resources, we have to continue to find ways to make safety a priority. Unfortunately for next year, it, it may not be better. So our treasurer's office has been working closely with people across the state throughout the county, really trying to pinpoint what some of those possible reductions could be due to COVID-19. And so based on a lot of those conversations, right now there is a possible projected reduction of 7% in income tax, which would be a little over 541,000, a possible 10% in state funding, which would be a little over 1.2. There's a projected 5% increase in the delinquency rate of property tax, which would be a little over 1.8. And then our casino revenue, they're anticipating to be reduced by 40%, which for, for our district would be around 175, a little over $175,000 reduction. Additionally, the board's considering renewing, it's not a new tax, but the PI levy that's set to expire December 31st, if that is, is not renewed, then we would also lose another 1.6 that we currently are able to designate exclusively for maintaining our facilities. So our total loss projection possibility, again, none of us have a crystal ball to see exactly how this will play out. And we really will start to know the full impact as we start collections throughout this next year. But there is a possibility of projected loss of a little over $3.7 million. This doesn't include the 1.6. If the PI levy is not renewed, then there would be, we'd have to add that additional 1.6, take that from the general fund to be able to maintain our facilities. And so there could be a total loss projection of a little over $5 million if that's the case. To put that in perspective, in 2010, we did see over $3 million in funding reductions and that equated to 52 positions in programming cuts. And keep in mind, 80% of our operating expenses are people. So you might ask, what about that federal money? What about the CARES Act funding that your district should be receiving? The way that's distributed is, distributed is in the same manner as Title I funds. And so right now that's based on your population of students who qualify due to low income. And so for our district, that equates to approximately $88,000. So you can see the total projected losses compared to what we are getting in CARES Act funding. There still is a need for concern in terms of our financial situation due to, due to COVID-19. So in summary, we're going to be implementing safety practices that we talked about on those earlier slides to help protect our students, employees, and families. Our hope is that we can bring all students back full days. Whether the board decides a five day or four day model, regardless of that to start the school year, again, that's something to consider. It may be a wise course of action for our district to maintain a remote learning day for all students during the course of next school year, regardless. Obviously, it gives us a lot better preparation and ability to flip back and forth between remote and in-person learning, which may need to happen at any point in time. And of course, there is the financial implications. Certainly, there could be some cost savings realized if students are not attending on those Mondays. If the recommendations are such that we cannot bring all students back full days to start the year, then we would start with our hybrid model. In the hybrid model, preschool students are split into two cohorts, half attending their half day program Tuesday, Thursday, and half attending Wednesday, Friday. Again, preschool will likely need to follow childcare guidelines, which could be different than school age guidelines. In the hybrid model, elementary students would attend in person four full days a week and be contained to a homeroom. Monday, would, we would maintain Monday a remote learning day in the hybrid model. 
Five, six students would also attend four full days per week in person, but be contained to their teams. In the hybrid model, model, again, that Monday would remain a remote learning day. Seventh and eighth grade students would attend two in-person full days a week, either Tuesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Friday, remote learning occurring on any day students are not in session. In the hybrid model, the high school would also feature that flipped classroom in an online environment with cohorts of students being brought in for face-to-face -face remediation, instruction, assessment. Again, that schedule is yet to be determined, but it will likely be a two day a week schedule as well. And all students would access remote learning Monday through Friday. If we have to start the year with the hybrid model, we are going to work with the health department to determine if we would be able to resume in-person learning for four full days a week, seventh through 12th grade. And then of course, preschool as well, if we're able to at the semester, we may even be able to make that consideration at the quarter. So we are, trying to build a schedule that allows us that flexibility. We also need to be prepared on the flip side to take more restrictive safety measures. We may have to go to full remote learning or certain buildings or classrooms may have to go to full remote, remote learning at any point of time in the year based on our local and district health data. Masks, again, I know masks are a very hot topic. We will wait to see what the guidance is. I think we have to be aware. It may not be all of our decisions. If we want to bring students back and the guidance is that students must wear a mask, we may be, we may be bound by that. So again, we will wait and see what the guidance is. At this point in time, we're anticipating that they would likely be required on the bus and in common areas with that high student traffic. We are exploring that face shield option if that were to be allowable. Next steps. So we are working as we speak of obtaining all of those safety equipments. We've already put orders in for several of the things that we're going to need. We've been able to repurpose some safety grant funds as well. And so we're working on, on obtaining all of those things. Another next step is we're working, we will be working on gathering additional information at the school level to determine the number of students who may need a full remote model due to health risks, regardless of our ability to implement that in-person learning. So for example, I'll jump down to the possible reassignment of some certified staff. If we have, let's say 40 elementary students across the district that need remote learning, perhaps we've repurposed some staff members who may also not be able to return as the full remote teachers for those students. So we'll also be gathering additional information at the school level to determine the number of students that would plan on utilizing transportation. Again, once we have that guidance and we're able to say, this is the hybrid model we're starting with, or transportation, yes, is one to a seat. We'll be gathering additional information to start to be able to really pinpoint our resources and how we need to allocate them. We'll also be, of course, communicating any specific reduction in hours for classified staff. If we go to that four-day model, certainly we will have staff that would be impacted by that. Monitors, paraprofessionals, bus drivers, we have several staff members that are present when students are present. And so we'll have to communicate with them depending on the route that we go. We also may be needing to amend our 2021 school year calendar to maximize in-person learning opportunities. So if we are in a hybrid model, for example, we have an in-service day in February that's on a Friday. We would be repurposing that day to a Monday to make sure students can report face-to-face -face on that Friday. Of course, determining any staff layoffs or reductions in force is necessary as well as once we decide on a path and have more guidance, we would be revising that financial forecast accordingly. We're in the process now of developing and adopting our policy on blended learning. Again, what happened in the spring was emergency. We know we need to be proactive in our planning move moving forward and be prepared for that remote learning option that could happen at any point in time. And of course, we'll be developing procedures and expectation for, expectations for student safety during in-person learning. So pick up drop off procedures, all of those types of things are going to look a little different. And we're working on those logistics at the building level so we can communicate those to families and for students to start the year. In regards to the calendar, I did wanna mention one thing. We already start pretty early in the, early in the year. I know there's some schools or districts that are starting even earlier with the intent then of taking off on Thanksgiving break and not coming back to after Christmas. Well, that may work for a secondary school. It would be, I think, very challenging for a K-12 district to implement something like that. And again, we do already start fairly early in August. So we're not intending at this point in time to change the start date of the school year, 
we're looking at more, if we have to go a hybrid model, how can we maximize in person and maybe repurpose some days that were scheduled for professional development or teacher work days, repurposing those days to those Mondays. Timeline for a decision. So as soon as we receive guidance in regards to social distancing in the classroom and on the bus, we will be able to determine if we'll be able to return to full in-person learning. Again, whether that full in-person learning to start the year is a five-day or four-day in-person model, that's something that's still under consideration. We're continuing to raise those pros and cons of a four-day in-person model, and we'll submit that consideration to the board as necessary. Or if the restrictions are such that bringing all students back in person for the school week isn't possible, then we'll have to start with the hybrid model that we previously went over. Again, keep in mind, unlike sports, weddings, amusement parks, going out to eat, all of which are permissible right now, again, those things are choices and attending school is a law. So we're really having to find that balance as a district. So Mr. Hostler, I'll kind of leave you with the final thoughts. I'm gonna mute my mic so we don't get too much kickback on the- um, No, thank you, uh, Mrs. Price for, for that. And um, at this time, just, I think everybody, uh, it's just one of those things when you hear hear this presentation, you just want to take a deep breath right now. So um, we've seen what, what has happened across our country and our state. And we know that since the middle of March, we haven't had the opportunity to have our students in our buildings and, and we had to finish up the year in that realm. We're optimistic that we're gonna have students back in place um, this fall. And given the best information that we have, we know that, that this plan is going to continue to evolve. This is a jumping off point for us. This is a point where we've had the ability to, to reach out to every single um, building leadership team, which is comprised of teachers, union leadership, um, our, our safety committee here district-wide that, that does have parents, every board member has been briefed on this plan. Um, this is something that we continue to, to refine as we go through. A thousand and one decisions have been made to get to this point. And there's probably a thousand and one more decisions and considerations that we're going to have to come to terms with before the start of the year. And there's nothing unique about what we're experiencing here in Perrysburg. Um, every school district, every school across the state is going to be wrestling with these same kinds of decisions. Um, and each of them are going to be shaped by their own unique situation. And this is our situation and, and what is unique about us we've tried to take that into account. Um, we know that there are people based on our survey that, that are let's open the doors and, and let's start school like we have for the past 155 years here in Perrysburg. And clearly that is not going to be a possibility. Um, this is a highly contagious virus that causes significant harm and death. And we understand that, that children are not impacted the same way as older adults, but we do have medically fragile students and medically fragile adults that, that serve those students. And you know, we have to be able to, to come up with a plan that, that takes all of that into consideration. And what that means is we all have to be vigilant. We all have to be disciplined and cautious in everything that we do. And, and that sometimes is, is challenging for institutions. It's challenging for families. And, you know, we have to make sure that as we look at returning, that we have to be um, all in this together. That, that our best chance at, at beating this is that everybody buys into what we need to do. And, and that's going to be a challenge. Um, but it is something I think that we can continue to do and to demonstrate and certainly it's something that as the year goes on, we're going to continue to evaluate. Um, if there is a second spike in the fall, like the, the, the Spanish flu, then we know and, and are preparing for that possibility. And if things continue to get better and there's a vaccine, then we know that we can return to a normal school year. We're prepared for both of those options. Um, this plan respects social distancing, so I don't want people to think, well, how, how can that do? It's four feet per student, students in most classrooms, and, and that enables us to provide the most instruction uh, possible for the greatest number of students. Um, and we know that some of our university partners are using a similar um, approach to, to their learning spaces, 
And, and we've heard and respect the six feet, but we also know that at four feet, it makes a world of difference in terms of what we're able to do. Um, and, and we also understand the science that, that there's, there's um, differences in terms of that social distancing and what works. Um, we know that the science is, is leading the conversation and, and you know, we, we're relying on those um, individuals. Um, the, some thought is, you know, let's just let, uh, you know, all, all, each school district make up their own mind. But we have people in the health department here locally who, who this is what they do. This is their passion, understanding how viruses work and how they're spread and how can we better protect people. And I think we have to let them be part of that conversation with what we do. Um, this plan is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There are things that I wish were very different about this. But the reality is this is something we're gonna have to get our, our, our arms around and, and try to manage um, providing the quality instruction that we have provided in past years in Perrysburg, but respecting what this, this virus can do to, to people that, that are, you know, that are friends and neighbors, our teachers, our bus drivers, our teammates, our classmates. And, and we know that that's something that we continue to, to struggle with as we, we focus on this. Um, if the governor comes out sometime this week and says, here's what we're going to do, we now have a framework to be able to adapt to. Um, we were asked, you know, should we even be planning? And our answer is, of course, it's our responsibility. I think it's important to have parents understand what we're thinking and be able to understand the reasons why and, and get the, the backstory. And that's what I really appreciate about the work that Mrs. Price has done is it's, it's, this is the decision, this is why we're doing it, and here's the reasons why. And um, you know, we're gonna continue to, to do that and, and keep our parents and staff informed as we move forward. So, um, so with that, um, we'll open it up to, to discussions and-, and, um, and yeah, Mr. Hoskins, what thank I would you. like to do, first of all, is thank you and Mrs. Price and the staff, the administration that worked on this plan. I know you've, every day it's changed. It's uh, two weeks ago, it was one way, and this week it's, it's even changed more. I would like to have the board, if we could go just around the horn and let each one of you ask questions to, to have exhausted them, go to the next board member and so forth. Maybe by the time they get to me, all the questions will be answered. So let, let's start with uh, Mrs. Downs. If you have questions from Mr. Hostler or Mrs. Price about the uh, rollout. You're, you're, you're muted, Gretchen. Barking. Sorry, I muted because my dog was barking. Uh, I, I think that uh, the planning has been exceptional and I, I'm very, I'm very comfortable with everything that is planned. I do have a couple questions, like, and, and they can't be answered today, they're just food for thought. Uh, can we use remote learning days and incorporate band and orchestra for those children who, if they lose that, that junior high band and orchestra, that's, that's a big loss for them. Um, so I, I would love to see us look into and see what the professionals think about remote learning on for band and orchestra. Uh, other than that, I just think the, the plan is good. The thoughtfulness is amazing. The hard work. So congratulations and thank you. So Gretchen. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Tom. Thank you. We are looking into that. So I was actually on the phone with Mr. Best today and we are trying to explore, not necessarily bringing students in on the Monday, but seeing if there's a way we can team students in those, in those creative performing arts classes, team them in such a way to be able to offer that in place of their creative arts, the performing arts in place of the creative arts for those students in those courses. So it's still a work in progress, but we are still exploring ways to make that happen. Okay. Yeah, and the one thing I, I would just add is um, we have such a, a wonderful performing arts and creative arts staff. Um, they've, they've begun to look at this and have already begun to brainstorm ways of, of 
you know, solutions maybe to come up with uh, a, a better way for us to continue to deliver some type of services. And, and we're open to that. So, you know, usually they are able to run with something and, and be creative and, um, and that's underway now. And so we really appreciate what, what they do and what they bring to the table. And, it, and it's painful for us to, to look at a schedule where that is excluded. So we're excited about the possibility of how can we make this happen? Um, but, you know, it is something that uh, there, there's a lot of hurdles to get through to get to that place, but we're certainly, certainly trying to get there. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Mrs. Eubank, questions? Yes, I do. I have some questions. Um, with the remote learning days, is it going to be similar to what was offered this spring, where um, the you can log on when you want to, or will there be more like Zoom interaction, or exactly what are the teachers going to be trained to do? That might be different than what we experienced in the spring. So, Kelly. We are currently working with the Department of Teaching and Learning to answer a lot of those questions. Again, what happened in the spring was emergency. And so mm -hmm. we're working on adopting a policy and setting procedures for what that would look like. So I don't have all of those answers, but in a simple form, yes, it will look different moving forward because we'll be intentionally planning for that and adopting a policy surrounding that. Okay, okay. And then, um... Thanksgiving week, what would that week look like with, um, obviously, if we did the hybrid model with no school on Monday, just students on the Tuesday would show, because it looks like on the calendar, it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off. That, that's one of those things, again, we're looking at the master calendar. Once we know for sure what model we would be moving forward with, some of those things we'll be looking at what makes sense to change in terms of student attendance days. So there's potential that some of that could change. We were more specifically targeting some of the professional development and work days and repurposing those. But I think we will have to, if we are starting in a hybrid model, look at all of those things and see what makes sense and trying to make sure there's an equitable amount of days that students in either cohort would be attending. Okay, and then two more questions. I just wanna make sure. So for the performing arts, it's fifth and sixth grade that, and I know you just went in that explanation, you are looking at options of including that, but for seven through 12th, it isn't still going to happen. No, for no. seventh and 12th, it is still occurring. The still reason occurring. we're having to make that reduction at the fifth and sixth grade level is because again, it's the we're, admitted, we're reducing that risk by keeping them to their teams. And, and so essentially your whole student population is coming four days a week where at the secondary level it's only half capacity right so it, those courses would still occur at this point in time we're planning for the secondary level but we would have to suspend them at the five six level in order to avoid cross teaming but again we're trying to see if we can be creative and change some teacher schedules around to maybe add that course in by team only to still keep kids within their team but it's going to take some creativity with that, but yes, so performing arts so far would be suspended at the potentially at the five, six level, not suspended seven through 12. Okay, okay. And then yeah. last, lastly, on the financial impact of COVID-19, the 8.2%, um, I believe um, that's been changed. Has that not? Because I think that's reflected on PM's five-year forecast to be, change it to 6%. Yeah, we'll have to adjust that. Um, this draft was done before that legislation went through. So we'll go back and, and um, make sure that we have that reflected, so. Excellent. Mrs. Larimer. Okay, there we go. Um, I, I got a second Gretchen's uh, comments. I think the amount of planning and headaches and and discussion that went into what you guys have created here is beyond stellar. Uh, I have told so many people that yes, once again, our administration and staff pulled a rabbit out of the hat. I thought what you did with Common Core was absolutely over the top remarkable. This one even tops that. So my kudos to you guys, because I just, I, I was kind of one of those that just wanted to pull the blanket over my head and say, I can't do it. I, I just can't even figure it out. 
Um, did I miss it? Did I space out when I was writing notes? What about all day kindergarten? That's one of my questions. If we go to the hybrid model, are we doing all day kindergarten? So that's a good question, Sue, and the answer is yes. So at the original point in time, when we started trying to wrap our arms around what we would be doing, there is a concern that we wouldn't have been able to keep students within a homeroom and we might have to be more restrictive. So in the fact that our hybrid model does still propose a, a four day in-person model, we are still intending on moving forward with all day kindergarten and we're continuing have to have discussions about that tuition rate as well. Um, so at this point in time, we are intending on having full day kindergarten either if we're just back to normal or if we're in that hybrid model four days in person a week, we're still able to maintain a full day program. Wow, okay. Um, oh, okay. So if we, to me, it seems very logical to start with this hybrid thing because of the unknowns either from the state or just from the virus itself, right? So I, I see that this is, really a very viable um, solution that you guys have come up with. Can we, like you, like you said earlier, Brooke, that we can't start and offer X amount of transportation, reduce it. If we start with a hybrid model at some point in time, if we feel or sense an all clear, either through treatment vaccine or, or it mysteriously goes away or whatever, can we go back to a five day um, school situation or are, do we have to stay in the hybrid if that's what we start with? I think, is it possible? The answer, short answer is yes. Schedule wise okay. it would be, but I th think there's a lot of things to consider with that. So again, that financial impact would be something to consider as well as the potential risk of having at any point in time to go back to a remote learning option for a whole building or the district. So that's something to consider is, do we anticipate that there's going to be a need throughout the year for 100 students, 200 students, 1,000 students to end up being on this cycle of having to quarantine for multiple days? So there is some thought behind, if we intentionally build it in and leave it in, we'll be much better prepared for flipping back and forth as we need to be. So that's some of the thought behind that. So could we, yes, but I think we'll have to weigh the pros and cons of what that would mean for our district, if that makes sense. Yes, and you, you brought in a good segue there too. Did I hear you say at some point in time that you know everybody's on the hybrid model, but maybe another building could go to something else or, or it went, <clears throat> How do I want to word this? Does it mean that if the if our district is on hybrid, everybody's on hybrid, and they'll they'll will stay on that, or can there be variations amongst buildings? I think our intent was if we need to start in a hybrid model, it would be that four day a week model, K through six coming in four days, maintained to their homerooms or teams, and then seven twelve doing half capacity alternating days. Okay. And so I think to answer your question, if we have to start that way, but let's say restrictions ease, then certainly we would look at bringing our older students in more often because they're only coming a couple days at half capacity. So I don't know if I really answered your question. No, I think you did because I, I was wondering if I was hearing correctly. So there's, there's some there's some fluidity even within the hybrid model as to what you could do with that. That, that makes it probably very interesting and often uh, chaotic as well. Um, Pam, this might be a question more towards you. Um, have we, is it even possible to come up with a cost difference between the hybrid model and a normal school year? Are we thinking that the hybrid model is going to be less expensive um, financially. I think it's costly insofar as, a, as the kind of social interaction that people can have and what they gain from that. But financially, is it less expensive for us to be doing a hybrid model? 
right now we're currently reviewing all that. So we've um, had all the principals are contributing and we're, re we're reviewing all the expenses to see and do a comparison. We're kind of doing some modeling to show you. Okay. Okay, because there have been some things that have come from this experience <clears throat> since February, March, when everybody went into shutdown, that have actually been some benefits. There have been some good things that have come from it. Um, my own daughter said, I would never have started a garden if I hadn't uh, been quarantined and didn't have to uh, be running all over the place for all of my jobs. And so, that, you know, that's kind of a, a good thing would it makes me wonder if if a hybrid model is setting us up for a good way to do education um uh it'll be an interesting experiment to see how that goes i'm not suggesting that that's what we would do i just wonder i mean it's a head scratcher you know how is this what is this going to look on the flip side when we get get through it and past it overall like i said i think what you guys came up with was was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. The other two questions I have are not are not relevant to this to this public. Um, it's more directed for things, so I'll I'll hold those off and, and uh, to save some time. But thank you for the opportunity to ask some questions. Bennington, question? so I'm glad you guys did leave a couple of questions for me, <laughs> and, and I will echo the other thoughts that are here. I mean, really nice job. In with a thoughtful plan that comes this far, this early with, with so much unknown out there. So thank you for the time to do that. I don't envy the, the you've made a thousand decisions already. I don't envy the other thousand decisions that are gonna come up um, as we get more information and more guidance. One of the questions I had was about um, the, the process for the staff reductions that were mentioned. Uh, Cause we, I, I've said it before, we're on a timetable here, right? You know, the, the clock is ticking. What is the process? When do those staff reductions, do those staff reductions have to be communicated to the unions? And what is the, what would be the timetable for that between now and the start of school? Um, I think the, so each, um, with each piece of information that comes our way, um, so if this week or next week, the governor comes out and says, you know, here's what you are keeping, here's what the guidelines are. And we begin to shape the, the, the school day around those guidelines. The next step for us would be to begin to evaluate like we are now in terms of, okay, um, with that student moving through their school day, how, what changes around them? What staff um, is needed to support that student through that day? Because we know that there's going to be um, different um, needs, you know, in, in terms of supporting those students. If students are coming every other day, um, you know, that, that changes a lot in terms of the staff that's needed to accomplish that. Um, so, so for us, with um, our labor agreements, there's language in, in labor agreements in terms of when we can, you know, issue what they call in the state a reduction in force in terms of letting people know that at a certain date, we're not going to need their services. There's guidelines uh, in the contract or, or language in the contract that says these have to be issued at different times. So we're aware of when those times are and we are um, you know, working through that in terms of when that would have to happen. So um, for support staff, um, there is a, a two week notice that has to go out. So any decisions about that would have to be within two weeks. Um, before it would take effect. The teacher contracts a little bit different. That's gonna take a little bit more um, conversations with our, our, um, our teachers. Um, there is a deadline in the contract when we have to notify individuals about the next semester. Uh, so so um, th that, that was actually in April. So while we were hoping to get back and, and looking towards you know, a return, not understanding the full implications of this virus and the impact, um, you know, that deadline came and went. So, so as we look forward to next school year, there'll be conversations in terms of what impact does this have on staff? Um, teachers can teach remotely for the most part. And, and with the plan that we laid out, it, it, it really utilizes virtually every staff member um, teaching wise. 
Um, so that makes it a little bit challenging with administration and, and other staff, we're gonna continue to evaluate the needs. Um, in 2010, which is the last kind of high watermark we had for budget issues facing the state of Ohio, um, we had to make reductions. We made them across the board to, to every, um, every employee group. And um, you know that, that blueprint would be something we would have to follow moving forward. This, um, if the hybrid is, is put into place, it, it certainly, um, there'll be savings um, in, in some of the areas for sure. And in other areas, as we talked about um, you know, with the permanent improvement levy, you know, the, the cost of adding um, different types of equipment, permanent things to help protect staff, you know, that's gonna be something we're gonna be doing. And, and things that aren't covered in the permanent improvement levy, um, you know, that are disposable in nature, like hand sanitizers and masks and things like that. So we understand there's gonna be some additional costs involved to what we do. So I think Pam and her team have tried to do a good job of saying, okay, now that we have this baseline, let's calculate what that looks like. So I know that's a long answer um, to a question, which is, you know, for support staff, we're looking at, you know, two week notice. For teachers, it's a little bit longer conversation and the other groups are um, more in line with support staff in terms of notification. That, that addresses my question and the second one that I had you addressed, I was interested in how the permanent improvement um, uh, levy would support the, the, the additional costs that are gonna come from the COVID uh, for, for, for safety protocols under COVID. So I heard that answer too. Yeah. We've been making some adjustments in terms of, you know, we have older buildings and, and since 1980, this levy is, helps, you know, keep those buildings in use and us being able to, to have students, um, you know, space for students that, that work functionally and maintaining our buildings well. Um, you know, as we get further and further into this, we know that we want to outfit at least one sink in every bathroom touchless so that students aren't touching surfaces. So we've looked at where can we reduce those instances, drinking fountains, replacing those with um, filling stations. We have some of those, but we don't have enough across the district consistently. Um, we've also identified, um, you know, initial high contact area, like a cashier in a, in a cafeteria so many students file through having that kind of plexiglass like you see when you go to a store today. Um, so we've already begun the summer looking at that or late spring. Um, the, the cleaning, the, the equipment that is more permanent in nature, the wands that Mrs. Price mentioned, um, you know, they clean a, a vast number of surfaces very quickly. Um, and, and that's something that we're looking at. So there's, there's those things that we wanna pull into this but we also know that hand sanitizer, those are not permanent in nature, um, gloves and masks mm -hmm. and those things. So, so yeah, we're beginning to shift that and, and we'll be sharing more of that with the board as we get further into what those costs are. Sure, okay. So I had again, thank you very much for the presentation and the thought behind it. I only have two questions and really again, thank you, Mrs. Price and Mr. Hostler. Uh, well, well played, um, I know that the board will get more questions from community, which is welcomed. And I know you and uh, your staff might get more questions because certainly um, this is not a plan in cement because it's like you said, it's always changing and improving. So we welcome uh, suggestions, questions, what have you to get answers to. Um, my, my only one is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit. With respect to the grading, we kind of abandoned grading last spring and now we're getting back to school again with the grading um, procedures. Do you foresee any type of guidance or parameters for the teachers with respect to not just using the days that we're back face to face as a testing period. I mean, is that not, is that something we shouldn't be thinking about or worried about? No, Ray, that's a good question. And like I said, we've been working closely with um, Mr. Schwartzmiller and the Department of Teaching and Learning. We know that we will be intentionally working to improve those remote instruction methods. We won't be, we won't be staying on pass fail forever. We that's not the case, especially if we're intentionally building that in. And again, essentially for teachers that are true virtual teachers, there are hours and weeks of professional development to go through to, to do that. And we were really thrown into it. So we're working on building in that into the school day. That's part of what those Mondays could be used for would be that collaborative time to really plan on how to deliver remote instruction because 
those days in person can't just be a glorified testing day. We really need to maximize that time in working with students and tailoring what that instruction would look like depending on the students that are in front of you. So there will certainly be work around maximizing that in-person time. It will not just be you're coming in to take a test. Right. And the flip I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, oh, you did. And the flip classroom was an excellent idea, but yes, you did answer the question. That's all I have. Yeah. And I think I think you know one of the things that happened, and 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 it, and I think it was, um, I think uh, Miss Larimer mentioned this in terms of you know, what have we learned, and how could this be better for us, and and I think about the transition, and I'm so proud of the staff for what they accomplished during this, you know. The, the closure and then and then the delay in terms of the and then the final you know announcement that we were going to be totally committed to to remote learning and in that time I think looking at what happened especially in the elementary buildings where the first thing that that we began to do is we bundled all the first grade teachers and said you know what let's have a common curriculum that every first grade teacher so we can better support that and that was something that as we look forward to the future there might be more of that kind of collaboration because I think that was very helpful in, in having every first grader, every teacher pulling their, their resources together and coming up with that common curriculum. And we understand that teacher, being, a, being an elementary teacher, high school teacher, there's a little bit of an art to it where I'm gonna go at my pace and I'm bringing in the things that I need. But in this crisis, um, that was still possible, but there was that framework that all the teachers worked from. And, and I think that showed us a pathway to get forward. And then when we realized that we were going to be out for a longer period of time, those teachers said, how we're delivering this to our, our elementary teachers is not, or our elementary students is not the best format. And then if you recall, that's when we pulled up Schoology. So teaching and learning, Brent Schwartzmiller, Joe Sarns, the principals all met with all the different grade levels across the district. And we did a crash course in Schoology. And, and, and that is a much better learning platform that we didn't really use before. But now that we've been exposed to it, now that kids are used to it, that is something that we want to have that flipped classroom. It provides that, that, that really foundation for us to build on. And eight months ago, elementary teachers were not even, it wasn't even on their radar that this is something that could be a tool for me because their instruction is knee to knee and, and that's where they live. But I think it has showed us now that there are some possibilities, but at any given time, um, that classroom, that disruption that, that Mrs. Price showed where, where we could have a teacher under quarantine for 14 days or until they're tested, um, that disruption that could be happening almost like popcorn popping up throughout the district, um, having that learning platform, having that kind of support from the team around to support that classroom so learning doesn't stop when that popcorn goes off, um, that's gonna make a world of difference. And, and um, you know, now we're, we're actually asking the teachers to live in two different worlds, that face-to-face -face and online, that blended learning. And, and I think that is really going to take a lot of work and effort, you know, and that's why it's, it's built into what we do. We know that there were some teachers that hit the ground running and it was phenomenal what they were able to do. And we have some that really, we're really proud of how far they came in such a short period of time while teaching. And, and so um, trying to, to build that capacity, that quality instruction, it's really driven a lot of the conversations that we've had. Um, and, um, you know, so I think, there, that technology, that online opportunity, I think it'll lead to further questions. We've talked about that ability of having what we wanted to have a third semester over the summer and allow students to work ahead if they wanted to and take courses maybe that they couldn't take. But now we understand that maybe this blended learning is a vehicle for us to do that and having our students be able to finish high school on a faster pace. Um, this could open the door for that. And having, instead of contracting with an outside provider to provide the curriculum. We have talented and gifted staff that can write that curriculum and, and, and be able to provide it to our students. Now we're moving in that direction. So I think those are really positive things. But at the beginning of the year, we talked about this idea, you know, the Commodore Perry, you know, the, the naval kind of uh, approach to all of this and that hold fast, you know, that, that oftentimes old time Navy um, folks tattooed on their, their hands when they were up in the sales. 
And, and I think as an organization, we've held fast and we've weathered this initial storm, but we haven't made the, the harbor yet. We're not in that safe place yet. And we're going to continue to hold on. We're going to continue to work hard and we got to get the ship to the harbor. And I think next year we have to view it that way. And we have to come in with that flexibility. And, and as a parent of a student who was deeply disrupted and, and a senior, um, it's sad to see that. And we want to work so hard to avoid that. And, and I think this plan maximizes that ability to get the students with, um, with families and, and doing the best we can. And, and I, again, we're not happy with where we are and, and what has to happen next year. None of us signed up for that kind of school year. But I think given the parameters that we have, the thoughtfulness, the, the detail, the understanding that this is a serious, serious virus that is a killer. I think with all those things factored, I think this gets us as far as we can go and being respectful of the science. Um, and I know there's some people that are saying, not my child, and I understand that. I know there's some people saying, well, a school down the road or, or across town advertised, we're bringing everyone back, full go, non, you know, we've got it figured out. That's great for them, and I'm not questioning that. But we've shown classrooms, we've shown schedules, we've gone through a painstaking process to provide families exactly the rationale as to how we're gonna keep staff and students safe and, and what will happen moving forward. Um, but again, tomorrow at two o'clock or the next day at two o'clock, the governor gets on and everything changes. But we have a framework now that I think parents can understand, that students and staff can understand and we can build from moving forward. And that's what this is all about. So. Yeah, the two, two important things you mentioned are our, our mission statement, assuring all students and you, you covered every student, those that can attend, those that can't, those that may have some cer certain situations. And, and you also, we talked about being trailblazers. I'm glad that we, that we did not wait to unfold this in the middle of July and July. It's important to get out there now to have this discussion ongoing to, to create the best plan for our district. So thank you very much for all the thought that you and the staff put together for this plan. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, that takes us to the Treasury Report item five, uh, five one, the May financial presentation, Pam. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, it's kinda, kinda keeps going in and out on my end here. So if you can't hear me, raise your hand, or you know what I mean, I'll try to get my attention. So um, if you wanna just click on that first May presentation 2020, It's just a short three slide presentation there. So um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> so our finance committee met Friday, June 12th. And I wanted to kind of go over a little bit what we covered. We reviewed the monthly reports, um, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, that we had, you know, kind of thought we, we, we were right on track where we thought we would be. We reviewed our five-year forecast and gave an update. We'll go over that here in a little bit. Appropriations, which are a routine protocol at this time of year, we have to give a final list. And then if, um, I'm asking for permission to do 50% of our initial. We've discussed that at a couple other meetings this year that we wanted to, especially in the last month or last six weeks, that we wanted to, um, instead of going with the 80% that I normally ask permission to appropriate at this time, we're gonna go with 50%. We wanna really try and keep a very close watchful eye on things um, and you know, just go ahead and do the 50% at this time. So once we hit July 1, then that enables me to be able to pay some of the bills that come in. Let's see, the next thing we went over was our recycle pay, which is um, every several years, we, because we are a biweekly payroll system, we have that year where we have 27 pays. So we reviewed that and the fact that I had sent out in district news to all the employees when it's going to be and the procedure in case they're new employees with a calendar. So everybody's way ahead of the time. I would like to send that out two or three more times just so everybody's aware of it. We also discussed payment in lieu, which is you know the money payment to parents who drive their children 
and we had, um, normally we pay $250, but because of the shortened school year, I'm asking for permission to lower that to $185 to save some money. We're going to try to attempt to save, show a saving somewhere every month of the next, you know, for the next 12 to 18 months and, and ongoing actually. And um, we did a recap over our stop loss renewal policy, just a short review of that. And we discussed the levy resolution and um, to prepare everyone what was going to be on the agenda this evening. Next. So 11 months in, um, you know, right now, the we are right where we thought we would be. I actually prefer the next one, Mr. Hostler, if you'll go down one more. So on the graph, as you can see, we ended May with um, 7,661,327 uh, versus last year. So we're up a little bit. Um, this is just kind of a quick review. In When we finish June here in the next couple of weeks, you'll get a very detailed report in July to go over the year, how we ended for the year. And with only a few more weeks into that, I don't wanna continue and you know, you've know you read the reports for the month. And again, if you have any questions in any of those reports, feel free to email me. I have received a couple of emails from board members and I will get them answered and I will reply to all so that you all see, because sometimes another board member might ask a really good question that you didn't think of. So really, those, that's really kind of a summary of what our finance committee, it lasted a little longer than normal because we went, we did have several more items to go through. So the next thing I would like to do a quick review would be our, I'll have the, the five-year forecast, I believe. As you know, we discussed it at our last meeting in quite um, detail but we did not vote on it. So we wanna bring it up tonight with a few changes to it. I don't wanna spend, I'm not gonna spend as much time, but if we can just pull that up, I know that it's been, I sent out an email and a text to try to remind folks that it was out there. Um, and I, um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody had it to look over because we did make a few changes. So if you, if you can pull it up, if you want, Mr. Hossel, you don't have to, but if you want to. The, um, I just, so can you guys see it? Everybody see it? It's kind of small, I know. So let's just take a quick review. We are still required to submit a forecast even though amidst this health and financial struggle that encompasses pretty much our area, the state, the country, globally, but we still have to submit it. And we did submit it, but we needed to have an official vote. So tonight I'm asking for approval and a vote um, we had, since we had a little more time then to review it, we took the opportunity to talk about it in finance and went to make a few updates. The change number one, after reviewing some um, information that Dr. Vogel shared with us and doing a little more research at every week, every day, you know, this forecast can change. As you know, it's just a projection for the current situation as of right now. So the first orange line shows you our income tax. We had originally thought we should reduce it by 10%, but in reviewing some further statistics, we're going to be a little more optimistic and reduce it by the by 7%. So it kind of changed it slightly at, um, to 7,188,000. Still dropping it. Then we're hoping for a quick recovery and then the 4% trend after that like we've been a company. I also added these notes to the bottom of this page just for you to have as a quick reference. Um, so the second change was, um, as um, a board member mentioned, we are now the we're doing we're we went ahead and had some encouraging news on June 11th last Thursday. I thought it was very encouraging that we will receive an offset and a, any district that lost more than um, more than six percent revenue due to the CARES Act and the governor's cuts were given some additional funds. Hasn't been fully approved yet, but we're being optimistic in the hopes that it will be. If not, we've built some contingency in just in case. And then the um, next change, if you go down to the personnel line where you see the orange, the salaries and benefits, we decided to reduce wages by using the proposed wellness funds. Now you might say, well, we know we have the wellness this year and next, but let's face it with the economic times and the conditions that we're looking at right now, I believe that we will continue to receive wellness funds. It's a judgment call. If not, obviously we'll be prepared to make cuts in that same amount, which is 178,000. So by doing just by tweaking just those few things, so you can see how much it changes our forecast, 
if you'll scroll down just a little bit, please. We'll still be deficit next year and the year out, but we're making such strides in trying and we will continue to keep looking and making cuts as needed to get the, you know, to keep our cash balance. But I, you know, it just, um, I, I just caution that this is a forecast. It's not how we, it's not how we've ended this year yet. We don't know that yet. We still have two more weeks. Um, there's some bills that can come up or some things that can happen that are unknown. Even up until um, we stop, we cut bills off about the 26th of June, you know, and stop paying. So we still, I know that sounds odd that we have 10 more days, but a lot can happen. So um, as soon as we have it locked in, we'll go over that in July and have a final. We'll know for sure what, what how we ended. But right now today, this is my best approach at trying to get us to move forward. And like I said, to continue to work on, you know, um, making our deficit less and to the point where it's not, where we don't have a deficit, we are ending with cash. And I think this is a, a proposal that I think we could all get behind. And I'm asking for your vote for this tonight to submit to ODE tomorrow morning, first thing. Okay, let's go back to five two and look. Uh, any questions for about the proof to approve the financials? Any questions for Pam about the uh, transportation and the appropriations? Is this the um, which one are we going back to? Five, five two. We need, we need to approve the financials. She presented the uh, $185 for the payment, the final appropriations for 20 and 50% of 21. Any questions? If not, we have a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Yeah. Roll call. I have a question, and the question has to come after the motion. Exactly. So, right. Yep. Um, the the payment in lieu. If we discontinue busing for the high school students, do we still have to, to fund payment in lieu? Yeah, Gretchen, um, that's a good question. So Ohio is one of the few states in, in the United States that um, has um, transportation that's provided to private schools and also public charter schools. So right now school districts are required to bus those students that are residents of the district um, to um, um, private or charter schools that are within the boundaries of the district, but also within a 30 minute radius around the district. So on any given day, we're actually delivering students to more non-Perrysburg buildings than we are Perrysburg buildings. So when you see that bus every morning on 475 at, at 830, and you're wondering why is a Perrysburg bus driving up here into Toledo? That's one of the reasons why. So the law says whatever we provide um, our own Perrysburg students, we have to provide that to private school and charter school students as well. So in grades K through eight, we'll have to continue to provide transportation um, to those uh, students. There's a um, another component to the cash in lieu, but it's also that we deem something impractical that outside of our district boundaries if you know we used to be able to bus students there but now it's impractical for us because of these changes we can then then those parents would be switched to cash and lieu so that is something that we'll be having some conversations about and i know that's disruptive to those families um, and we'll do the best we can but you can see how transportation could change dramatically for high school families getting and this is the question gretchen um, if we're not providing transportation for our families, um, then we're, we, we're not obligated to offer it to private school and charter school families. And then that would end, you know, if we're not providing it, then we're not paying for it either. So that's my understanding of how that works, you know, moving forward. So Pam, I don't know if there's anything you want to correct me on. That's good. <laughs> Anybody else question or discussion about 5-2? Right now, we're just approving the, the, the financials in 5.2. That is correct. Yeah. Okay, we have a first and a second to approve 5.2 of the financials. Roll call, please. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. 
Mr. Coleman. Yes. Okay, then. Bye. Oh, sorry, Ray. That's all right. <laughs> Five three, five three is the approval for the forecast, and we need a first. We need a motion, and then I have a question. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Discussion. Questions. Okay, I have a question. Um, so you you changed the um, the uh, line where it says change one. I'll just go that way. Change one. Yep. So what was that based on? What was your data based on? Dr. Vogel came to us. Can you hear me? Sorry. I'm sorry. Did you ask something else, Kelly, after that? I'm sorry. No, you changed it from 10% yes. from two weeks ago to 7%. What's the data that gave you that information to do that? Dr. Vogel comes to our meetings and, you know, I'm, we had not really had the 10% was just a really rough guess. So when we were originally reviewing all this, we said, well, you know, it was back in, you know, we start looking, working on this forecast in, I want to say March, April, and it was really early on in all this pandemic and things. And I think some of the thought process was, well, you know, uh, we're not working, all this is going on, nobody's paying their taxes, nothing this. Well, he did some preliminary research that was, I felt substantial to prove to me that, and he had been doing some um, very well respected research that says people are paying their taxes and there are people that are working and the demographics of Perrysburg support that. And so 10% seemed awfully high when the range was supposed that we, the recommended range originally was five to 10%. We went with 10 being the worst just because of the, at that time we felt that. But after listening to that rationale, I really, I really feel that 7% is, is fair. I mean, we don't, you're right, we don't know but I'd rather take the chance of being a little bit um, positive since some of the data that I'm seeing through him indicates that people are, are working and they're they, maybe not at the traditional workplace, but I think there's a lot of executive type work that people are working at home. And so I do believe that it can be supported by some of that research that he had that, you know, that we've been talking about. Um, so, yeah, and the finance, the finance committee also talked about the fact how the housing is going, like is selling above the asking costs of many folks who have their house up for sale. So in the finance committee, Kelly, we had talked a lot about that. Um, what may happen in one district or one area uh, is not the same in the other one. So that was a, a probably pretty, pretty good move to change number one. Okay. Um, the, and then change, oh. the third thing the finance committee has talked about is that it has... Um, New assumptions come up. This may not be the last time we see this five-year forecast Mike. before October, November. I think in oh, these type of environments with so much uh, volatility, uncertainty, um, it's appropriate to continually look at our assumptions and revise as needed. Okay, and then change number two. Um, I see that the House and Senate passed it, but the governor has not passed it yet. So if it's not 100% guarantee, why would you include that? Well, I, I just, I really believe that he will. I do. And I think that our fine, some of our other numbers down below, I can't say 100% sure, but are coming in a little bit lower. So like our purchase services are coming in a little bit lower, that 6.722. I have four invoices that could sway this one way or the other. And ironically, they're about $200,000. So I felt justified in and taking a chance that he's going to sign it, the governor. And if he signs it, we'll get it immediately. We'll get it this month. We'll come this fiscal year. Yeah, so the 19th. Yeah, we'll get it like on the 19th in our foundation. Okay. That was why I felt pretty sure that, you know, I think he'll sign it. Okay. And then um, you did address the um, change three, the wellness fund. Again, um, if it's just guaranteed this year and fiscal year um, next year, why go to 2024 when you don't even know if you're going to be getting that money? Because I really, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, excuse your five-year forecast. I just, now here's what I think it does though. I think it shows that we're willing to support wellness and student improvements or student. That's not the right word. I'm sorry. Endeavor, but student support or student success. We're willing to do that. And so if that means if he doesn't give us the money, we're going to find the money. And if we have to make some cuts or adjust somewhere else, we will. And that seemed like a fair um, place to show it in this forecast. 
And I was going to add too, Pam, that um, really when you look at the five-year forecast, the state is funding us on what they call a biennium budget. So the state does the school budget two years at a time. So in this five-year forecast, we're really having to predict almost on every line that, a touch, that, that is connected to any type of state funding, a projection of what that future, not only this year biennium budget, which was changed, but the next biennium budget, and then the one after that, which might not even be this governor. And so there's, so there's and when, when um, Mr. Bennington talks about the, the chance that we're going to have to come back and visit this again, I mean, that's, that's why I think this year, next year, you look at this five-year forecast very intently. But when you get out to two biennium budgets from now, I mean, it, it gets challenging because you don't even know who's going to be governor at that point in time. But what we do know that this governor made it a point that the student wellness funds is something that he drove through the legislation and has time and again talked about the importance of this. And when we talk about making changes to the, you know, taking those dollars and reapplying them, his administration has really pushed back on, on capturing those funds for other purposes, which is what the House and the Senate has tried to do multiple times for different types of funding, um, funding approaches. So, um, so could that all change? Yes, but how and what, based on the best information that we have today, um, knowing that this is a priority that he really pushed through, this is where we are. And these are the assumptions that we're making. So it, 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 it's an imperfect science. So when we look at that last five years out and say, boy, this number, that number, you're right. Who knows who's going to be governor, what ideas are going to have, what the funding program will look like for schools that year. Um, but for this year, for next year, that's really where you have to have it dialed in. Any other questions for Mrs. Harrington? Okay, at this time, we we'll need to take a motion to approve the five year forecast. Didn't we already, oh, already, 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 already take it? Yep. Oh, well, I'm not going to miss it this I'm not going to miss it this month. <laughs> Who made the motion? I didn't catch that. Who made the first? Um, Sue Ms. and Eric. Sue and Eric. All right, Kay, Sue, we'll come back to you. Any other discussion since you made the motion? Nope, all set. Any other questions? Roll call vote, please, Mrs. Harrington. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Sorry. Mr. Bennington. Yes. Mrs. Downs. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. No. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Sorry, I have like a B or something in here. Okay, so the <laughs> next item, I, I'm sorry, it's just I, <laughs> the, next, the next item on the, under the finance part is our resolution to move forward with our PI you know, the resolution with declaring the intent to proceed. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to review that. Yeah. Yes. Do we have any questions? No. I guess, Ray, sorry, you were supposed to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we accept it. Is there a second? I second. Okay, any discussion? Sue, we'll start with you first since you made the motion. No. Nope. Motion discussions? All good. Anybody else? Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? No. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Harrington. At this time, we're at item six, board committee reports, and we'll start with the uh, operation committee. Mrs. Eubank and Mrs. Larimer. Any reports? Uh, uh, for operations, um, out of the out of the whole meeting, and but Brooke touched on it ah, a couple of times. Is the fact that they're going around and putting touchless faucets in? We're just full of puns tonight. Um, I thought that was really a great idea and going to the expense of putting in the filling stations versus um, um, 
water fountains, those, those little guys, those are expensive. And it made me realize that in trying to follow the guidelines, trying to do the things that are being asked of us to do, once again, that's costing the district a lot of money in order to do that. But they're on it and they're working, working pretty hard at getting all of that done. So that was, that was one of the things beyond the, the meeting minutes that I wanted you to know about that they're, they're laying the groundwork for all of that. Mrs. Eubank, anything you want to add to operations? Um, no. Okay. Oh, it's all in the notes in the minutes. Okay. Uh, how about the People Services Committee? Ah. Uh, go ahead, Gretchen. Okay. Um, our committee met, uh, and of course, a great deal of the committee was devoted to of the meeting was devoted to the review of this plan that we just saw tonight. Uh, one of the things that on um, pupil services that I, I did think was interesting that you won't know, but Andrea Glesser has looked into um, clear masks for special needs children, for teachers for special needs and for the lower primaries. And the reason this is so important is that's how children learn language and patterns is by watching our mouths or watching our expressions. So I thought that was a great idea of Andrea's. We're curious to see what they look like when they come in. Yeah, we, we were wondering if uh, we'd have a worse fogging up problem than what the current masks already do. And But she actually added that pediatricians are recommending not to send kids um, to daycares that where everybody's wearing masks because exactly what Gretchen was saying is that they need that facial interaction to actually learn. So I think that research is, should be really made important to know when ODE and the health department and everybody else down in Columbus who tells us what to do um, they need to understand that those that that hurts the kids and in, in one of the important things that they learn as younger students, and that's the social uh, aspect of it. One of the other things that uh, Sarah mentioned was that they didn't use as much of the Title IV funding that they had already scheduled to use, so they're using it as a social worker for over the summer. Um, to help some of the at-risk students that have been identified. And I thought, wow, that was something that hadn't crossed my mind. Um, not, that, not the at-risk students, but taking money from someplace that they didn't use all of it and getting a social worker type thing to help over the summer. And I thought that was a great use of those funds. Thank you. And I think, Sue, if I could jump in, or I'm sorry, um, Ms. Larimer, if I could jump in, I think the, um, the social worker is addressing certainly a component of, of you know, helping students after this, this long, um, all the changes that have happened since we've been off in March. I think that's going to be very important. We also know that we're proposing to, to hire an additional um, high school guidance counselor because of all the grade levels that band is going to face the biggest obstacle of returning to normal and we need to have more support there and, and that work. And then you heard Mrs. Price talk about the, the, the nurses or the health aides at the elementaries. You know, back in 2010, we reduced it 50%. That never came back, but looking forward, um, we know that that's gonna be a bigger need than ever. And, um, and so you're seeing us continue to find ways, um, you know, through this grant that you mentioned to creatively support students to make them more comfortable in the classroom and help support them in ways so that they can continue their learning. So um, it's, it's thinking about those other ways of supporting staff or, or supporting students is really vital to their success. So, um, so it's great to hear them continue to explore those. So I just wanted to jump in with that. I'm glad to hear that um, there's 
the high school counselor addition is is back on the table and being thought about because even at the time that it was proposed what a year ago or so that i thought that was something that was really needed seeing how overworked they are we can't afford to have our our counselors for those high schoolers not have the attention that they deserve so i'm glad to hear that that they're that's that's good news Okay, let's go to policy. Uh, Mrs. Eubank, anything to report? No, so it looks like um, we're gonna be discussing on the agenda a couple of the policies coming up. Communications committee, Mrs. Larimer, Mrs. Eubank. Um, if you saw the dashboard was um, skipped in spring, but they're going to be mailing one out for sure in the fall. So if you've been wondering why your mailbox was uh, a little lighter than usual, that's why. Um, and they've already got the supply list for next year already thought out. It's like, really, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know how they do that. That's just amazing. She also mentioned that um, the notification system that they're using can be pinpointed to reach individual groups. So not everybody gets blasted with something, but they can target who that information is pertinent to um, so that there's not too much unnecessary information going out. I thought that was really neat that she's able to now manipulate the system so it's it's getting to where it needs to go. And, and uh, I thought that was I thought that was really pretty cool. It was a it was a really short meeting, um, but we meet again. Let's see, this was June. August. We'll meet again in August. Thank you, Mrs. Larimer. Mr. Bennington, how about anything on personnel committee or finance that you want to follow up with? Uh, probably the only new thing that I'd mentioned. So in both meetings, we spent some time uh, talking about um, what's called the stop loss insurance renewal. Perrysburg's the district being self-funded. Stop loss insurance is kind of a very key thing to have in place. It kind of puts a cap, uh, for lack of a better term, on the amount of insurance claims that we would pay on any one individual or for the district in total. And it's probably no surprise. You know, we pay a premium for those like you would a normal insurance policy. It's no surprise that those premiums, certainly in a period of COVID, are going, are going up, going up by about 13%. So Kelly Johnson was very patient, so was Pam and Tom and, and Brooke to let me kind of ask about other options we could look at, you know, increasing a deductible, taking having the district take on more risk, what would that do to our insurance premiums? Um, and it was just kind of at the end of the day, it, uh, it would be a bad bet, be a bad bet, because if you can expect a second wave of COVID, hopefully not, but if it was to happen and all of a sudden the district is in a first place to pay those insurance deductibles, that's not a that's not a healthy thing to do. That's not a smart risky. That's not a smart risk management play to, to do. So uh, we got we after taking a look at the premiums and they went out to several bidders to try and uh, uh, test the market and came up with the one staying with the incumbent HCC Life because they're the ones that were the most cost effective made the most sense. Mr. Thank Bennington, you. if I could add something um, or um, yeah, did what I screw up there. I thought no, 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 no. Did you explain what um, stop loss is and how it works? Um, I, I, yeah, I, so stop loss is, so, so the district is self-funded, means we pay essentially our own medical claims. Somebody has a slip and fall, we pay that. Um, you know, in, in a typical medical claim, that could get pretty high because it's self-funded. You know, we don't want to take on that risk uh, uh, to, to infinity. So we then pay a insurance carrier, a stop loss carrier, an amount to put a cap on there, called the kind of called the deductible. I believe we pay a hundred or we pay up to the district pays up to one hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars. Anything above that, then the insurance carrier steps in. So when I was talking about, so you pay a, you pay the insurance company obviously to take on that risk of anything over one hundred and seventy thousand. Um, that premium's going up because it just more claims are expected in the future. Um, so we took a look. What I, you know, kind of what I was referring to using the numbers is what if we increased that deductible, that limit up to two twenty-five or two fifty? 
would that lower the insurance premium? It probably would, but it also means now you're exposed to an additional fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of claims that you have to be the first dollar. You have to pay the first dollar on. So we, we, I, I think uh, Kelly and Pam and 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 whoever else was involved with it did a very nice job getting quotes with the assistance of their advisors and um, taking a look at those quotes and kind of coming back to a decision that makes the most sense for the district. Thanks. We didn't want to put you on the spot, but I know that not everybody understands what, you know, what kind of insurance, you know, we have property casualty, we have health, and this is another component to that. That's important. So thank you. Probably the only thing a guy like me gets excited about. So you could hear me <laughs> Being a CPA, this is your world, and yeah. I, I, I get that. So, well, CFO. thank you for the reports, and and I just want to mention to all board members to encourage you to, if you have a question about a particular committee, feel free to call a board member. If uh, you know Eric and I served on finance, if there's a question that comes up, give us a call, and we can tell you what was talked about, or you know Sue or, and Kelly on communications or policy, Gretchen and Kelly. Uh, feel free, um, certainly call Mr. Haas or Ms. Mrs. Harrington, but also it's, it doesn't hurt to talk about from committee to committee before you wait to see it on the agenda um, with the minutes. But anyway, just want to throw that out there. Okay, let's go down to the consent agenda, and we're going to look at uh, items 8 through 12 under the consent. And you can see that the first 8, 1 through 8, 4 deals with the minutes uh, actually, eight five. We have contracts, typical hiring nine one through nine four. Uh, nine four. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. We don't have a motion yet. Yeah. Okay. No, no, we don't. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, and then ten ones again. You know, personnel. So ten one all the way through um, eleven two deals with hiring different personnel and so forth. So we're going to go um, and ask for a motion for the consent agenda. And again, that's items eight through 12. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <laughs> Eric, you take it. You try okay. it. We had a first. Now though. We had a, who, did we have a, do you have a first? Who was the first? I didn't get that. Gretchen. And then I'm giving the second to Eric. Mrs. Downs, do you have any questions or comments about the consent agenda you'd like to ask or bring up? Uh, not yet, not right now. Okay. I anybody do. Anybody I else? Do. I'm gonna go I with the second. Do. Who had the second? I, I do not have any questions. Okay, thank you. Do I have go a ahead. question. Yes. Can I ask my question? Yes, I was okay. going to the person who made the motion first. And now oh, I'm sorry, there. thank you're you. Good. I just, I thought it was muted. No, you're good. Okay, so why are we voting or why are we approving minutes we already approved at previous board meetings? My, my recollection is there's a correction that had to be made on uh, an agenda item, I believe. Is that correct, Mrs. Harrington? Yes, on the May 6th and the others were never approved. We went back. We always do an audit for the last meeting in June to make sure we have them approved for the year. And we did not have the 20th or the 8th on there. The 20th was the one where we voted on the teacher contract and their wage opener. And then the fourth was just, I think, a regular another. These were relatively new to the Zoom. And so the, the minutes have not been on this to be approved. And the, okay. sixth had, the sixth had a typo because the resolution numbers got out of order because of a change. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. OK, because that was my exact same question, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. I so we um, there. I'm sorry. We should fix that to say revised. Okay. Yeah. Because I noticed I looked up one and we had already voted that. So if if I found something wrong in in um, eight point three and eight point four, do I bring that up now? Yes. Yeah, so then we can correct them and bring them back the next meeting. Okay. So in eight point three, can you click on that, please? Make sure I get them down. <laughs> okay, wait a, minute, wait a minute. Oh, go up a little bit. This was, um, wait, wait, which was the date on this? I'm sorry. Okay, May, you wouldn't have said the safety briefing because we were all in Zoom. 
that was never said. Yeah, that's that's a on a template that they have on there all the time. So what do you want to do? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Can, you want us, we can I, don't know, I don't know how legit and legal it has to be. I just saw that and said that was never said. Right. I know oh. where my exit is. <laughs> yeah. Does it help that I tried to find my exits? <laughs> well, that was just something I noticed. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that correction. Okay. And then um, was that 8.3, 8.4? Oh, okay. there again. Well, no, that was that was at the Commodore. This was the April, and it says remote attendance. That's when Gretchen and I did not attend. Correct. So, um, when you say remote, like I wasn't on the phone or anything. I watched it, so I thought I was on remote attendance. We were on the Zoom, weren't we? On the Zoom on that one. I don't think we were zooming. I mean, we were on like uh, Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, yeah, Facebook. So you didn't watch it, Kelly, Mrs. Huber? I watched it, but it wasn't like this where we're talking. I, I you know, uh, yes, I watched it, but I, it wasn't. Um, you want to mark it? You want to mark it? I didn't understand when you said remote. Oh. So we can. Um, why don't we say that, um, participated via Facebook Live? But you didn't really participate, did you? Well, I know because then it says down here voted yes and um but you had to you know that's what i if, i don't if know this was the day that gretchen and um mrs eubank did not attend yeah she couldn't have voted she, she could not have voted. voted yeah because we watched it but it wasn't a, right. a dialogue right. like we're having now so right. okay I would just remove remote attendance period from the a call to order, then we need to remove that we voted yes. Well, let us let us fix them and then we'll bring them back to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. That's a good catch, Mrs. 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 Eubank. Thank you. So we'll bring them back to the July, whatever we end up having July. Okay. Can't we move to approve as corrected? Well, I think we should fix them since it's kind of unusual times, don't you? Or Okay, that's fine too. That's fine. Whatever you're comfortable with. I think we should fix them because it's unusual times. Yeah, we'll, okay. be, we'll, we'll be back soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Okay, we had a first and a second. Any other discussion, any questions? Consent agenda? Roll call please, Mrs. Harrington? Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. That takes us to item number 13. This is the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding with the PEA regarding the supplementals in the event of COVID-19 enclosure of or suspension of activity. I need a motion to accept this MOU. So moved. Second. 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 Discussion. Mrs. Downs, any questions or discussion? Any board member, any questions or discussion? I I just I read this about, I swear, a hundred times because I just want to make sure I, I am actually reading it correctly. And we had some discussion about it last time, but I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding it to the full, you know. So on one of the examples in chart B. It could be soccer, it could be football, and that's what it's, it's, it's showing. It still looks as if you, you get paid before, you get your 45% prior because you do, let's say, football. You start, I think, maybe in June doing conditioning. I don't even know if they're starting yet, but let's say July. So July and August, you're doing conditioning, you get your 45%. And then you play five games, so you only did and you have 10 games, let's say. So you played five games before school was closed, the state came in. So you did 50% of the game time. And then it looks like you're gonna get paid 90%. Am Correct. I reading that right? Correct, you are reading well, that correctly. Yeah, I think just as a, a clarification, 
the the fifty percent is not the games played because there is an entire you know the the official start date is August first and the first game isn't until several weeks after. So in that scenario, they they've maybe completed seventy percent even though there's only five half the number of games are left. Um, so so you know we're looking at the start date with the practices and then the last potential regular season game or event. So 50% is in the middle of that, not based on the contest played. So I don't know if that helps clarify that. For the pregame stuff. That's before the season begins, correct. And the season begins in August. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. The season, uh, Mr. Eubank, they're actually started June 1st to July 31st preseason. And they have right. spring, winter, and fall conditioning. And then August 1st starts their um, actual practices. And then the game starts about August 22nd for your fall sports. Their season begins. So if they get their half the games done and they have half more to go, we're paying them 90%. That's that, again, the season that they're being paid is not based on their game schedule. It's based on when the official start date of that activity was and when it ended. Okay. So it's August. Because, so yeah. So you could have soccer, which has more games earlier in their calendar or later in their calendar, but we're talking about the first official day of practice and then the last day of the regular season. And then the 50% point is in the middle of that. So the amount of games played in the first half or second half aren't part of this conversation because it's based on the, the, the start date of the season and the end date of the season. All right. The wording says 50% of halfway point of the official season. Yeah. Which I think, Mr. Hostler, I think you did a nice job. I know you worked very hard to get, language of any type of language. And um, I think this is very fair, not only to the district, but to the uh, staff that are hired under supplemental contracts. It's fair and it's clear that, you know, we value the time they put in out of season, during season, um, in the off season. Any other questions? Roll call please, Mrs. Harrington. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? No. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mr. Coleman? Yes. Okay, item 14, board discussion on new business. I just want to bring up that uh, thank you very much for uh, getting and reaching out to, with respect to the evaluations with Mr. Hostler and Mr. Mrs. Harrington. We'll be getting back in July when we're face to face to uh, be able to have some discussions as a consent. And so thank you for that. And also I can't say enough of a thank you to Mrs. Downs for mm -hmm. honoring the class of 2020. If you haven't had a chance to drive by the Commodore yet, it's almost completed. And she was one heck of a planner. So thank you, Mrs. Downs for on behalf of the class of 2020. That was outstanding, Gretchen. I will help with the takedown, I promise. <laughs> well, anybody who has a little free time tomorrow morning at nine, we're going to finish up. Ah, uh, there you go. Well, good luck. Thanks. And Is anybody and else? Do I, send me some more pictures, okay? Okay. I do have a, have a couple questions for Kelly. Sure. Um, First of all, when in your campaign, you campaigned very heavily on this board should have had money in advance for a rainy day. It was poor planning. They should have gone earlier for the money. They needed the money. They knew they would need the money, but they didn't go. You campaigned on that. Yes. All right. Now... You know we need the money for the permanent improvements. You know that we will be going into the red. 
And we have a 40 year levy that has been voted in every year for 40 years. And now you're saying, we don't really need that. Do you wanna to explain to me your thinking on that? Sure, sure. Um, the rainy day fund is needed for um, things like example that's going on now. I don't think we would be financially so devastated in this situation we're in if we had a rainy day fund. It's antiquated thinking to not need that rainy day fund. Um, I think we need to get away from that. Perrysburg's always done it this way and therefore we're not doing that. We need to set up for success quit deficit spending. That's exactly why I didn't vote for the five-year forecast because out of the five years, two of them show deficit spending. And there's no accountability when you keep on deficit spending. And so I am against that. Um, the reason I'm not voting for this PI levy is because I believe there's a time and a place and this is not the time to put the PI levy with the economic times we're in right now. Um, I think it would be a good um, gesture for the community to say, we realize you just passed the operating levy of $53 million for the next five years. We're going to spend that money wisely. We're going to use that money and we're going to put that money towards the stuff that needs to get done in the PI levy in place of the PI levy. So still do the improvements. I'm not saying don't do them. I'm saying we're going to need to budget the best we can and get the money from the, the um, general fund. Okay, I, I, I agree with you that a rainy day fund is prudent. Uh, by voting no on the um, PI levy, it's a great sound bite, makes you look real good in the paper. I read your whole article in the paper, it was great. But That's exactly what I said at the meeting that day. I know, I know. Um, I'm not out to look great, Gretchen. I'm out to do the job. It was All right. so. Really these are sound bites. To do. These are campaign promises. These are okay. But now you're on the board, and now it's real. It's not sure. just a campaign promise. It's real. So, Absolutely. so no wait. Let me let me ask my question. Okay. So, in the five-year forecast, that 1.6 million is not there uh -huh. because it's a separate fund. If we do not have that fund, that 1.6 goes comes out of the general fund. So this year we end with 2.5 million. That, that's good. Next year we end with 1.1. 1. So you just voted that this particular deficit spending is okay. It's good. And then in the next year, um, it goes down to 800,000. So that means the deficit spending is almost $2 million. And that, given all that information, I think the public appreciates that you are being this watchdog. I think they do. And I would like you to be able to explain to the public exactly what you are cutting for next year when we do not have the levy. I, I want, ex I want, I asked you this before and you said, well, I don't know, but you've had a whole month. Okay, so Gretchen, me, oh, good. Gretchen, let me ask you, is it the school board's job to come up with the list of cuts or is that the administration's job? That is the administration's job and it's our job to approve it. Correct, and we approve it. So it's not my job, nor your job, to come up with a list of cuts. If I am voting to decrease funding, I feel it is my duty to the public to say, I think all day kindergarten is unnecessary and I'm going to remove it. Or I think orchestra is unnecessary I propose that we save $1.6 million by cutting orchestra. It, it is, you can't just say, I don't approve of the PI levy because I think there's a time and a place. Unless you can give some 
basis on how are we going to function without going into the black, into the red. So that's what I'm asking you. How are we going to function without going into the red? Well, that's a great question. And I would certainly refer back to the performance audit that was done for months for our district that I'm sure is sitting on a shelf. I dust that off and I would look at that and I would start from there. Okay. And if the committee that's still getting together, coming up with suggestions, I would take those suggestions. I'm not privy to say the orchestra would cut $3 million or $300,000. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. So that's why I believe school board members don't come up and say, these are the cuts. I would wait for the administration to show me what they're suggesting. The, the administration has shown you what they are suggesting. They have already shown you, but you are saying that's not good enough. I think we need to get rid of another $1.6 million of revenue. So that is falls upon you to give us a plan. I'm saying use the $53 million over the five years that we just approved for the operating levy. You can take those funds out of the general fund and apply it to the PI levy. That's what I'm saying do, to do. And that's what the five-year forecast is. And the numbers show that when you... When you add in 1.6 for maintenance that you currently don't have, that you are in the black in a year, in the red in a year. So that, that's where I need to understand what we're going to do so that we're not in the red. Again, I would refer back to the performance audit that took months to do, that I would go through that and, and make those recommendations. That is exactly where I would start. I mean, the, if we have to make these cuts, yes, it will hurt. That is part of making the reductions to balance the budget and be accountable for the taxpayer dollars. Okay, so- That's what I am passionate about. Yes, you are correct about that. Okay, all right, just, just to be clear, because if you go back and read that. Read what? Read the um, audit that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Read it carefully. They uh -huh. say, take your district down to state minimum standards. Uh -huh. So I guess that's what you're propose proposing. I think that looking at that, and again, it's been months since I've read it, looking at that would be a good start. That is what the state, they did their job handing us this information. We have a committee, several committees that are still meeting to come up with a suggestion that they're gonna to present to the board. I would review that. But again, it's the administration's job. That's not our job. Well, okay, so one of the suggestions that came out of the audit was to cut 10 custodians. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? In the um, time of COVID, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I would personally, I think starting where you're not affected by the education. So excluding teachers, perhaps cutting a few custodians because we have according to the state audit, more than a state or a school, a district our size, a district, maybe we do need to cut some. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you for that discussion. Anything else and new business before we go to item 14-2? Before I go there, I want to go back to just to mention and under classified personnel, we did have a resignation, uh, Kim Finnegan. Uh, she was a secretary of Frank. And Mr. Mr. Haas, anything else you want to say about that? No, I, I just, you know, thank you. Um, it, it's just, um, you know, the, the secretaries, uh, Kim has been um, working at Frank. And um, if you've been around a school environment, you know how important secretaries are and, and just doing all the things that they do. and. Um, Kim's been a, 
was a great hire when she came to Perrysburg and we're certainly sad to see her uh, move on and, and um, we wish her all the best and just a, a terrific person and a great family and um, you know, we wish her all the best. So uh, just uh, two secretaries leaving this summer that that's pretty much unheard of in, in Perrysburg school. So, but um, you know, bo on both counts, schools. you know, great people. So thanks for ca calling attention to that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Hostler. Um, under item 14 too, I just suggested Mr. Hostler, the staff is coming back to work on a larger scale July 1st. And I thought, you know, this Zoom is nice, but not quite as nice as face-to-face. -face. And, uh, and I know we can practice social distancing in the Commodore cafeteria. And I'd like to have us come back in our work session in July to start getting back. If our staff's coming back, if it's possible, if, if you would like to. And I know there's a policy that the states are um, given us that if you can't make it back, if you don't feel safe, you can still do some things remotely. Um, th open that up for some discussion there. Well, I personally um, um, would love to get back. Um, I, I know you guys know my line of work. I do private in-home health care, care for somebody in their 90s and somebody who is 87. And so my line of work, I'm very conscious of what I do. And obviously, if I get sick, then I cannot work. I don't get paid. Um, with Ohio just now opening up, um, I was just reading an article about Florida, Arizona. They've had an increase in cases. I would like to see um, coming back in August as opposed to July. Obviously, kids are going to be coming back. My daughter's going to be going to school. Um, you know, I, I would be more comfortable. I haven't gone out to any restaurants. I haven't done things like that yet. Um, for me, I'd like to see at least one more month. But again, if I choose, I mean, if everybody wants to come back, I, I can still continue to do it Zoom, I guess. Yes, you can, uh, Kelly. That was one of the things that I asked on one of my OSBA um, webinars this week, this week, last week. Uh, since we are still under the umbrella of HB 197, um, we can have an in-person meeting and, you, and anybody else can do it via Zoom. I don't know, Brooke, how, how much of that is a problem for you and or for Brent to coordinate all of that, but it's, it can be done and votes are still uh, valid. Anybody else want to weigh in? Uh, I, you know, the, the, this, and I just spent all day on Zoom and, and, you know, the technology is certainly nice and we're all going to learn how to do things differently, but I do think it's important that we all get back together as, as soon as we can, because it's just better that way. But at the same time, I don't want to, I, I will not demand it if, if somebody feels unsafe about it as well. Uh, so do you need a motion, Ray, then? Well, I think if we want to do it the right way, we probably should take a motion and vote and then go from there. I, I, what I'm looking at too is the fact that if we're asking the staff to return, I think we maybe should try to do the best we can to return. And, but anyway, uh, is there a motion? Yes, I will move that we return to face-to-face um, -face board meetings beginning with our July meeting for those who wish to attend. I'll second. Second. Any other discussion? I would like to make an amendment to the motion. Yes. I would like to amend the motion and, and what will happen is I will make the amendment. If it gets seconded, seconded then we will vote on the amendment and it will count as the, the new motion. If it right. doesn't get seconded or gets voted down, we go with the original motion. So I would like to move that we move back to regular meetings in August. I second that. Now you have discussion on the amendment. I'm more comfortable with that. That's That's... I would feel more comfortable in August, just again, looking at the Ohio, just opening up. Let's look at how everything's going. Give it another month. Um, I, I see the point, but I also think that as us as being the leaders 
if the staff is being asked to come back in July, we need to be doing the same. Staff, but not teachers. Majority of them. I don't think it's relevant. We're asking people to come back to work in July. So therefore, well, the majority I think majority of the people, teachers, are coming back in August. Well, they normally would anyway. They're working now. They're, they're having meetings over at the central office now. There was a curriculum meeting today with the foreign language department. And they're there. They're wearing their mask and following procedure. Just a point of clarification. Yeah, yeah. They're coming back to the classroom in August. All right, Gretchen, you threw a curve at me here. So uh, we had a first and a second in the original motion. You brought up an amendment, and you had a first and a second, but... Now you vote on the amendment. Vote on the amendment, Ray. All right. Roll call, please. Mrs. Downs? No. Gretchen, you're voting on your amended. No, I'm voting on my amendment. And after listening to the board discussion, I decided <clears throat> that I should vote no. Gotcha. Thank you. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mr. Bennington? No. Ms. Larimer? No. Mr. Pullman? No. So now we go back to the original motion as a first and a second. Any further discussion on returning in July for the work session in person? Practicing COVID-19, safe practice and social distancing. Roll call please, Mrs. Harrington. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? No. Mr. Pullman? Yes. M motion passes. And Mrs. Eubank, we'll make sure everything works that you are there in attendance through the Zoom or whatever they, if it's Facebook Live. I'm not sure how Mr. Hostler and uh, the, the group will get it set up, but it'll work. We'll make it magic. He'll yeah. make it happen. <laughs> Um, so you said the work session. Are we not having a, um, a regular meeting in, in July? Yeah, a work session. Yeah, we, we would have a regular meeting, right. Okay, well, you just said you're, you voted on the work session. To, well, to... we would return starting the work session. We would, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm going to set it that way. Okay, got it. Don't we often not have the regular meeting in in I July, if we don't need it, I know we, we did but one I year. Think, we needed the votes. I think you're right, Sue. And not talk with Mr. Hosser, but I think we've got so much on the table here with respect to the restart of the schools that it probably would be best if we did meet. I mean, I think there's so <laughs> yeah. much to talk about. I mean, <laughs> but I, you know, Mr. Hosser, what do you th think about that? Um, I. Yeah, I think, I mean, as much as I hate to say that, I mean, July is that time where, you know, people try to sneak away and do stuff in. Um, family, you know, I think between now and that, you know, those July dates, there's going to be a lot happening. So I, I think we could always decide to cancel that second meeting in July if we get to that point, but I think keeping it on the books with, with hiring and other types of things might be worthwhile. So sure. sadly. And if, and if there's some committees sadly. that could if there's some committees that could forego their meeting, that's up to the, the administrator and you as a committee member or, you know, but and I think it would be easier to cancel if we could than it would be then it would be to put something on the schedule. Right. So at the very right. least, right. let's hold it on the calendar and see how we do over the next three weeks. Right. And I would like to, uh, the July 7th date, we were planning to meet in executive session after the meeting to discuss, um, you know, the evaluations, Mr. Bennington, correct? Yes. Okay. Anything else for the cause before we ask for adjournment? Um, I've got two things. Um, I've heard such positive feedback about the um, meetings now being online. People have the accessibility to watch them when they want to. I hope you guys have as well. And I wonder if this is something that uh, we could continue to do. I, 
I'm, I'm, I opened up to Mr. Hostler. I'm sure it could be. Yeah, I've heard such great feedback. I wondered if you guys have had the same. People are watching them and, and... I will admit the one thing, the first time when the comments were coming back, back and forth, I didn't appreciate some of the things that, uh, because at a board meeting, you can't really talk to us while we're having our meeting. I, so that's why the format changed a little bit. Um, yeah, I think I better. Out. Yeah, that, that was just, <laughs> but yeah, I, Mr. Hosser, is that something that possible to you continue? Know, with board with board docs, you can you can um, film your meeting and you can label sections. So let's just say I wanted to hear what the I wanted to hear the financials. I'm not kind of, I'm not interested in the whole meeting, but I'd love to hear the financials. Um, there is a way through board docs that you could start your I, I don't know how you post it. I don't know exactly how it works. I saw it in a demonstration and I thought it was great. And then you could just go on and you click on financials. Or let's say you wanted to hear the discussion on, on today's MOU. Then you could click on that, just that one thing. It's, it's really slick the way board docs can work. The problem is, Mrs. Downs, I'm wondering about the capability of doing that now with everything everything going on with the restart and the decisions being made. Maybe in the future they can look into that and keep studying it. Or maybe Mr. Schaefer already knows something about all that board talks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, the way it's working right now, and, and I know we had a correction with the board minutes because in addition to, um, you know, um, operating the meeting, I mean, it's it's, we'd have to really investigate because it is uh, challenging for the way that we're doing this now. I mean, it's working, but um, recording this, I mean, we have uh, Mrs. Price who's, you know, running YouTube off of her laptop. I'm doing the screen share, floating in documents, um, all those kinds of things. So it's really hard to focus on conversations, keeping track of motions and what's happening while we're, we're actually managing that. So I think we'd want to investigate, you know, what is, what would it mean to have someone else come in and do that? Because right now we're, we're all pitching in and doing all that we can, but it is, um, it's challenging and it's, um, it's hard to be the superintendent treasurer, uh, you know, yeah. participating, you know, presenting, and then also pulling stuff up and making sure people are being led into the meeting and then let out of the meetings. And, you know, we're frantically saying, okay, we, we're missing a person and they're coming up on the agenda and who's all that's going on behind the scenes instead of being really focused on the meeting and what's happening and engaging. But moving back to in-person meetings, we'll start to recapture some of that. And then it becomes more of a strict, you know, more of a, um, question of how do we set up a camera here to capture it, you know, stream it, you know, or, or capture it and then post it, you know, on video after. So it's, it's, it's easy to do. Lots of districts do it. Um, I think we just have to make sure that we have it set up so that, you know, in the middle of a meeting, we're not having to shut down because, you know, we got booted off or the internet fell, <laughs> fell off. So, so, um, yeah. But we knock on wood, we've gotten through this relatively easy. But, you know, like I said, the one correction, I was dragging stuff when it was being pulled out of the consent agenda. And you said it should be 9.1. And I accidentally put it in 9.2. I mean, those are the kinds of things we really want to avoid as much as we can. So, but yeah, I think we can investigate it. Um, but I don't think you want me being the director and editor. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> It's certainly worth looking into and we'll see how much more engaging it is when it's just a camera off in the corner of the uh, boardroom yeah, versus I this. I agree. Okay, then last question. Since we're gonna be meeting in person in July and the school is opening up July 1st, when are we going to terminate the resolution to grant treasurer and the superintendent additional authority? That's something the board can talk about. I think we said that uh, by 2021, I think it was December, it was a date that's currently the date that's in the con uh, in the resolution. I believe that's December some date. 
December 31st. We were following along when we open and the board, right? Well, we were following along the guidelines of HB 197, and right. that goes through December. Correct. Yeah, through December or until such time that the governor lifts the state of emergency. Was that the language? Yeah, not. I have to go back and look through yeah, that and see. Yeah, I mean, it's worth a discuss. I think that's a good agenda item for for a work session. I think so too. Maybe we can have that on the work session in July. Just educate ourselves and have the discussion. Yeah. And remember, the board can do it any time. I mean, once we get back and get rolling, I mean. I thought it was put in place because we weren't meeting regularly and things needed to be made, choices, decisions needed to be made. But now it seems like we're consistent with doing our work session, our regular session, committee meetings. Seems yeah. like we're back up and rolling. Well, there's a decision, the, decision on the fly that had to be made and to, to get the board all together and make a phone call. We need to give Tom and Pam um, our utmost confidence that they can make those decisions under the restrictions given in that resolution. So uh, that's something we can talk about. Something yeah. we can talk about. Actually, there's some unknowns too. A second wave, a, a, a shutdown order again. It may be nice to have that in place. Um, well, yeah, and we've got the Zoom meetings in place for that as well. So, things to consider, but I like the discussion. To Downs? I was just going to say, we have to look at the language because I thought we gave them... Um, extended powers because of the state of emergency, mm -hmm. because things happen, because the state may say schools have to have sanitizers. They have, let's just say the state says the school must invest in camera technology to take temperature of students as they enter the building. Well, we want, that would be a major expenditure, but we would certainly want our superintendent to be able to, to do, comply with the law without having a meeting if, if it meant delaying the start of school or something like that. The, so, the, language, the language says, the authority granted to the superintendent and treasurer under this resolution will remain in effect until the schools are authorized to reopen by the, Ohio, by the Ohio governor or the Board of Education acts to revise or terminate the authority granted under this resolution, whichever first occurs. So that's, that's the language. The governor opens it up or the board decides to make the change. Whichever is first. Whichever is first, correct. Does that mean open it up in full or does that mean open it up with restrictions. <laughs> yeah, that's how things happen with resolutions. It's not that specific. We remain in effect until the schools are authorized to reopen. So if the governor authorizes reopening to me, it's full go. Five days a week. That would be to me, not four days or three days. So yep. he says we're good to go 100% open it up. This yep. resolution is, uh, is ceased. Yep. Well, if the Board of Education wants to revise or terminate the authority granted on this resolution, we could do that. So December, I didn't see the uh, 197, but this is what the resolution reads. So and we can oh, talk about it. Finding that, Ray. Yep. Okay, can I ask for a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. No discussion. Roll call, please. Mr. Pennington? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Thank you so much for, again, your time tonight. And again, if you can help out tomorrow with Mrs. Downs, or at least go on over and take a look at it in the evening. It'll be completed for the graduates of 2020. Have a good evening. Thanks, Thanks, well. Thank you.